Hey everyone, we're going to call the meeting to the order. Today is Thursday, December 7th. It is 9 a.m. This is the Fort Myers Beach Management and Planning Session. All council members are present. Town manager, uh, town attorney, town clerk, if you please rise. Vice Mayor Adderholt, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I'd be honored to do that. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item for discussion is a presentation by Schenkel Schultz Scape. Long-term coastal resiliency planning. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Vice Mayor, and good morning, Town Council. Thank you for having us here today in your beautiful island. My name is Natalie White. I am a Lee County resident. I am an ocean lover. I'm raising two children to be ocean lovers as well, and I love living and working in Southwest Florida. I'm also an architect, and I have the privilege of leading our Southwest Florida regional office for Schinkel Schultz. Um, here on the screen, you may remember some of these headlines, and that is really what it felt like. It's been 404 days, a point of no return, and uh, the landscape of Fort Myers Beach has changed forever. A lot of decisions have been made. A lot of conversations have been had. Um, we understand that the founders of Fort Myers Beach created a vision that still holds true today, that is creating and maintaining the beauty, vibrancy, and viability of Fort Myers Beach. The key words here are action items, creating and maintaining. Now the future, when the founders created this, is a lot different than what the, re the future we know today. And so we believe that that needs to adapt to the reality of what we're, the challenges that we're facing um, living on a coast, while still maintaining that vision. So what do we know? Where are we at right now? We know that Fort Myers Beach is an economic driver for the region uh, and for um, Lee County. Your success is our success, and you're not alone. We also know that there have been a lot of conversations and a lot of meetings and more meetings. <laughs> um, but now is the time to take action and really bring all the, those conversations and lessons learned uh, to create and maintain that vision that the founders talked about. We also know that members of your community want to preserve the character of Fort Myers Beach. We know they want to keep what makes it special and not lose sight of who they are. But I know that Fort Myers Beach is more than just a beach. It's more than just the buildings that have colors on them and that have a Florida style cracker homes. It's really about the community and the people that make the beach special. We want to protect the island. Fort Myers Beach is a barrier island. So thank you for being the first line of defense and protecting the mainland. But who is protecting you? So why are we here today? We know that in 400, 404 days, a lot has happened. We have survived a catastrophic catastrophic event there have a community has come together and a lot has been accomplished that we should be proud of we also know that we have adapted we're adapting the fact that we're here at Diamond Beach Diamond Head Beach Resort for a town council meeting says it all you lost your town hall and you lost the heart of the town which is Times Square but the real reason we're here is to, to answer a question the question is, what does a thriving Fort Myers Beach look like? And we can't answer that without having community thought leaders with us answering that question. 
because we don't want to just survive. We don't want to just adapt. We want to thrive and thrive better than we did before. So who are we, who are we and why do we care? <laughs> We are, I work at Chinkle Schultz, like I said, our vision is to inspire our community through impactful design. We are a multidisciplinary studio of storytellers, a mix of architects, interior designer, graphics, construction administration, stewardship, and sustainability team. That's a lot. <laughs> We're a Florida-based firm. Uh, we have three offices in Orlando, Sarasota, and Southwest Florida here. Uh, we're, we're celebrating 31 years in the region, and... Um, we are happy <clears throat> that we've been a part of this community from Fort Myers <clears throat> to Marco Island up to Port Charlotte. We're working right now in Sanibel, helping them with their rebuild for their, the new fire station 172. And I bring that project up because it has it, it faced a lot of challenges that the town is going to be facing. It's working with FEMA to get the, the height and the elevation for your ground level. All the restrictions on your height that the, the city of Sanibel has, but also helping the team figure out and making sure that we follow the process so that they can get the FEMA funds for that project. So beyond beyond what I do as an architect and as a, in, in our firm, personally, the day after Hurricane Ian, and as a citizen, you know, I was fortunate enough to not have anything happen in my home. We had just opened up our new office a week before Hurricane Ian celebrated our grand opening. And we were again fortunate to not have had anything happen. Um, but that was really a call to action as everyone felt in the community. And um, I had the opportunity to, to, to connect with strangers. And uh, that call to action was to create a grassroots group called Rebuild Southwest Florida. And it was all through a text. It was all through a text change with total strangers. Uh, we knew that there were a lot of um, elderly commu communities that didn't have the physical ability to move their entire home out to the curb. And the help wasn't really coming fast enough. And so we decided to create an Instagram page and see if we can get maybe 20 followers, 10, 20 people to come out and help us and maybe help a community out. What ended up being our very first post, we, we had got 400 followers that first day. Second day was 800. And it just kept doubling day after day. What that told us was that the need was really great, but the volunteers were also great. And so with that um, seven months of working physical <laughs> labor, um, helping the residents from Marco Island to Sanibel. Um, it was a, the most wildest and wonderful experience that I, I got to be a part of. Um, but in that, I got to meet a lot of people. And um, once San Carlos Island opened up, we were able to get into the island quickly. We had this, created a logo, so we looked legit. <laughs> we were able to get into um, Cutlass Drive and into the Shrimping District, and um, and then once the once the residents were allowed to get onto uh, Fort Myers Beach, that was our first plan of attack. And this little map here shows all the streets that we were <clears throat> that we touched as a group. And to be honest, there's actually more I couldn't remember them all, but um, that was you know again getting to really meet the residents, and that's why I know Fort Myers Beach is not. It's not about the beach, it's about your community because you have some amazing residents that live here um, and amazing people that helped each other out. And so, um, I, you know, one, one story I wanna share with you is a gentleman that I, we were helping out on the beach and he, he had lost everything, his mobile home, didn't have insurance. And um, he asked if we could have a couple of people help his community out. 50 people showed up and there were young people <laughs> young families, college students, and um, he just started crying. It was really a circle of everyone crying. And he cried, he said, this is the first time I cried. And I was like, really? You lost everything. And he said, well, I just didn't think that anybody cared, especially young people. And I thought, I lost all hope for the future generation, but his hope was renewed. 
And what I experienced, you know, the following that we had was a younger crowd. What I experienced was that they, they want to see a thriving Fort Myers Beach. They want to be part of the change. They want to be part of what is happening. And they're not leaving. They want to raise their families here. And they are the future. So when you make decisions, I just ask that you think of them um, because they're the ones that are going to stick through it and make sure that it is executed. So we did, um, you know, we were I was recognized for the work, which is really wonderful to be named <laughs> Defender of the Gulf and Southwest Florida Citizen of the Year, which, you know, it's a, it's a big shoes to fill. But we, the reality is we didn't come here to do that. And we're here to, we're, it, the work has only begun. You know, we just, we've gone through the survival mode. But what is it to make it, what are we going to do to thrive? And so we're, what I want to tell you today is just that we're here to stay and we're not going anywhere. And we want to see a successful Fort Myers Beach. And just know that you have thousands of people around the world that are following and watching what is happening here. And they want to see success happen at the beach and be an example to Florida and to the future cities that are going to deal with the same thing. And so we have people around the world that came here and helped, and, and that's just a wonderful thing. So um, we, we spent seven, seven months working on the beach. And um, it really wasn't until the mosquitoes came out that really made us say, okay, we need to take a break. <laughs> and um, in that break, we ha were able to kind of think and see and figure out maybe what is a way to really help the beach and really how, who are the people that need to have that vision to help guide the town. And so with that, um, we began our conversation with Scape Studio. And I have Pippa Brosh here, here, and she's going to talk a little bit about Scape. But really, the combination of... Can, of, I, can I just interrupt oh, for a sorry. second? Because you, you said you've left because of the mosquitoes. That makes you sound weak, but you guys were literally, <laughs> no. as I understand it, just talking to you yesterday, you guys were literally in the mangroves. Yes. That's why. It wasn't like you were just yes, worried sorry. about mosquitoes. You better explain that just a little bit because yeah. you guys were literally cleaning up mangroves uh, yes. in the water. And, yeah, uh, we, we, we focused on uh, the mangroves on the road um, to kind of like <clears throat> fix that area um, off of um, Big Hickory, Little Hickory Road. Yeah, so it was physically going in the mangroves and, you know, sending 80 people out into the woods is probably not the best with all the mosquito bites. So um, that was really, just, it was a good timing for us. And a lot of the cleanup had already happened and the pickup, so it was difficult to get the pickup. Any, um, so um, we were, that was, it was just all worked out. Timing was good to kind of take a break. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. no worries. So um, Scape, and I want to let Pippa talk about Scape, but... Um, they are, um, the work that they're doing, and she's not going to say this, but they're brilliant, okay, amazing work that they're doing, um, innovative, outside, outside of the box thinkers, and um, we're just really fortunate to have the opportunity to, to bring this together for you. I mean, it has been a process to get here, um, had had a lot of conversations, and in addition to Escape, you know, we've had conversations with the collaboratory and Fiber. And, and figuring out ways that we could work together um, to partner and bring everyone's expertise so that we bring the most value to the beach. And so let me let, me, uh, let Pippa start here. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm Pippa Brashear. I'm a resilience principal at SCAPE. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am because you don't know me from Adam. Um, and I talk a little bit about our work, but I really want to get to sort of what can we do with Natalie and her team to kind of help you take that, that, that next step. Um, I'm a landscape architect and planner at SCAPE. We are landscape architects, urban designers, urban planners. Um, we're based in New York, New Orleans, and now San Francisco, and I am based in New York. I apologize for bringing the cold weather today. Um, but I, uh, I, I was actually born in Gainesville, didn't live there for very long, but grew up in the, the mountains of um, the Virginia. And so working in the Southeast and the, and the Gulf Coast in Florida is really close to my heart. Um, we have our office in New Orleans, but we've worked throughout um, throughout the Gulf Coast um, and also in, uh, in in Northwest Florida and Jacksonville. 
Um, we really work uh, on landscapes at all scales, from small scale parks and plazas to regional plans um, in, like in, along the Chattahoochee River or in the Barataria Basin in, in Louisiana. Um, but really, we pride ourselves in being, in being eco-aware and working with the land and the landscape. Um, I really work a lot in water and waterfront communities, and we can't fight the water. We've got to learn to work with it and adapt. We're collaborative with our clients and the communities we work in. Um, we like to be engaged, engaged with the people and communities we work with, but also the land and the landscape. And we're systems thinkers. We don't design your sort of typical yards or parks, we're really working with the, land, the, the natural systems and the infrastructural systems because we see landscape as part of the infrastructure of our community. Um, and the focus of what, like, what I do, and I want to kind of talk about how we think we can work with Fort Myers Beach and, and, and Lee County is we work with communities to design a resilient future. This is a vision plan for the Barataria Basin um, around, Louisiana, around uh, New Orleans. Um, we also bring innovation to the water's edge, and that's at the core of a practice. This is Tom Lee Park in Memphis, um, Tennessee, that we designed that just opened. So it really spans the work from systems thinking and visions to built work. Um, and we've been recognized this. Our founding principal, Kate Orff, was uh, Times 100 person this year, was the first um, landscape architect to win the MacArthur Genius Award, um, and really have had sort of national and international recognition. But at the heart is working with communities towards a resilient future. And what does that mean? Um, right? Resilience. It's a big buzzword. We got a lot of projects. We do resilient. And I like to put this definition up because it, it does mean something. And it is not, it, reconstruction is part of it. Rebuilding is part of it. Flood risk reduction is part of it, but that's not really at the heart of it. Resilience is the capacity for us as individuals, as a community, to survive, adapt, and thrive, despite and in the face of shocks and stresses, despite future storms, despite development pressure, that we can achieve where we want to be um, and even transform. It's, it's social, it's environmental, it's personal, it's economic. And so we want to think about holistically. And I think right now Fort Myers Beach is at an inflection point. Right, That recovery, resilience doesn't start after recovery. It needs to start, so you start directing that movement there. And so, you know, I do think, if you talk with Fiber, the collaboratory, taking a systematic resilience plan for Fort Myers Beach is really important. It, that's how you guide smart investment. That's how you let other people know what it is for Fort Myers Beach to thrive, right? Federal money, state money may be flowing in, but you need to tell them what that needs to be done to you. So you need to guide that smart investment. You need to instruct, th ensure a thriving economic future and identify and implement pathways towards that project by project. And frankly, right now in this environment, we need to do that to be eligible for state and federal funding. There's a process they're looking um, to see, but you need to leverage that process. Um, I want to talk a little bit about just... Um, some of our experience and some of the projects that, I, that resonate, I think, with Fort Beach, but I've, what we would like to circle back with and have some time to talk at the end is what we might be able to do for you. I think embarking on that resilience planning process is important, but where do you start? It seems like you're at a real point where you need to get some visions and ideas on paper that can start at an island scale, that can start with a place that everybody wants to focus on, like Times Square, um, and so I think we'd like to, to propose like a two-step process where we can come back, get to know you better, craft a vision, and set a roadmap out for how you do that longer resilience planning. Um, but, you know, who am I to <laughs> say this? Where is my experience? I want to talk a little bit about our personal and professional experience in New York in the wake of, of Hurricane Sandy. Um, this was devastating. It was a wake-up call. As someone who grew up in rural Virginia, I did not think I was going to be climbing over down trees and power lines in Manhattan to get to work. But that was the reality. Um, and there were a lot of challenges um, and traumas that I am sure resonate with all of you. But one of the things that New York City did was create a plan. And it was a plan that addressed all the different systems. It looked at buildings. It looked at insurance. It looked at utilities. It said holistically what happened, how are we getting, where do we go. But they also really, New York City is a, a city of neighborhoods. You might not see a lot of parallels, but there's a lot of 
in smaller waterfront communities. And this plan, we worked really a lot on the coastal protection, really created a roadmap that over the last decade, we've been able to check off those projects, bring money in, check off projects, get them done. But I want to kind of take it down in scale. The other thing, it wasn't just about what the city was doing, it was what was about uh, community partners, nonprofits, and we were fortunate to be part of a project called Rebuild by Design, which was sponsored by HUD, but was really a partnership um, with uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, private philanthropy, regional nonprofits, and academic institutions. And so those are big partners that I think you need to bring to the table because the normal government processes aren't going to leverage the innovation and the creativity to create the vision. And those early partnerships, that, that philanthropic funding was critical to getting the, the vision and making the space um, to do pre-design, we call pre-design, pre-development, and get those bold ideas out there. So our design-led team with SCAPE, um, one of the, I use this slide because one of the things we recognize is in the wake of Sandy, everybody was making these maps. What was damaged? You know, how can I build a wall to wall off the beach? Well, most of, if not for New York Harbor, that wouldn't be New York. I mean, one of the things that we share with Fort Myers Beach is we're water dependent. It's the lifeblood of our, of the economy. You know, here it's your beaches, there it's our port, um, but really the, the life and culture. And so we said, there's got to be a way that we can come up with new strategies that are tailored to specific neighborhoods that provide risk reduction, embrace your own local culture of living with the water, and enhance the ecosystem of the harbor because that was important. And this, this community in Staten Island, this is the town of Tottenville, dubbed the town the Oyster Belt because it was you know, founded with oyster farmers. We said, how can we revive um, some of the, the ecosystem services that those oyster reefs provided to, you know, to create um, uh, you know, to create this necklace of breakwaters that, that acted and provided habitat like reefs, but also attenuated waves and took back erosion um, and really built back the beach. And this was a bold vision idea from that competition, but that brought the, the federal funding to the table. We are able to work with the state to take this drawing, you know, this vision of what this could be to combine wave attenuation. Right, but, you know, we took that picture tested it with engineers. How do we design healthy ecosystems that put back some of the services that those oyster reefs provided and really start to build a culture of resist resilience in the community and take that picture to reality. So this is this year, they're under construction. Did it take a while? Yes, but one of my passions is, is bringing those lessons learned to make sure that innovative solutions like this don't take as long. And there, a lot has happened now. I think we're in a position where funding is coming to fund bold ideas and thinking, and you need to be at the forefront of that um, in order to, to make it happen. That's not to say breakwaters are the thing for Fort Myers Beach. I just want to emphasize that, that having that bold, strong vision and that roadmap to implementation this is other work in Manhattan. And we've really taken that and leveraged that to work with other communities and challenges. So I was talking to Natalie about what's, you know, the challenges that, um, some of the challenges that Fort Myers Beach faces and, and some of the, the different projects that we work on. And none is a parallel, but just to take it a little outside New York and say, you know, one of the, we were working in another island, Nantucket Island. Um, you may know Nantucket, and it's in Massachusetts. It may seem a world away, um, but they have what they have Washington Washington Street, which is their main drag. How they get all their goods and services in to the island. It's like a Stero Boulevard. You got one way in and one way out, and all of the town center um, is off of um, is off of that, as well as homes and businesses. And it's, this is not a flood map from a big storm. This is what, this, this is what normal sea level, this is what a high tide is going to look like in 50 years for them. And so they have a real existential problem. And we were working with the land bank, the local land bank that had a lot of property on Washington Street and said, how can we do it? The, t the city, um, the island is making a long-term resilience plan. It's going to take a long time to do that infrastructure. How do we actually do things now that can improve our waterfront and reduce the re and increase the resilience of that that roadway? And so, um, developed a framework plan that said, what can the land bank do with their parcels? What can the town do with their parcels? What can private property owners are still do there? And create really a framework plan um, that allowed them to have a vision for that whole corridor. 
you know, whether or not, depending on choices that people made about moving buildings or not, but also a catalytic project. Well, first project that the land bank could do on land that they had to uh, create and to enhance a beachfront destination integrated with coastal defense infrastructure. And now they're working on an MOU with the town to move this forward towards implementation. So that bigger picture and that first step. Um, you know, bringing it back to, to Florida, Eckerd College on Tampa Bay, you uh, know, it's a college. Can I just interrupt here yeah. and go back to that previous slide? Yeah. Because I think it's kind of interesting. So now, um, go back one more. Yeah. So, so there were... With this drawing here, all the businesses that were on the oh, on the we're gone. Yep. Hold on. I can talk loud. Oh, uh, we got to make. We got to have it out. Oh, oh okay. Recording and all that yeah. kind of stuff. When too many trees plugged in. <laughs> it's like a commercial break or something. <laughs> this moment of silence brought to you by the. Fort Myers Beach Public Library. <laughs> Gives you time to grab a water. <laughs> yeah. Wow, dude. Man. Wow. So thanks for coming out, by the way. So I used to be one. Of, I, used to be, I used to be one of your biggest fans. But it's a big group. What part of what part of Virginia? Part of Virginia? Uh, West Charlottesville. Oh, okay. a town called Crozet. I grew up in East Tennessee. Yeah. Oh, okay. Further down the Appalachian. Yeah. Line. Yeah. Well, I also lived a lot of similar. Plug in an extra tree. Franklin County, West Virginia. Oh, right. Yeah. Plug yeah. in an extra tree. Huh? One too many lights. My mom decided right. she wanted to be on the east so coast of the, of the Blue ahead. Ridge. And yeah. Let me switch the microphone on on the. Uh, yeah. Okay. That. We'll just have to talk louder. Oh, we're going to be speaking for that microphone. I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm sorry. No, we'll, we'll just have we'll have John King. Something soft. Just like on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. I can, yeah. Ask your question, and then I can kind of just flip through some of these, but I think just want to get to a conversation. So. Tonight's top story. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, you can hear me. Go ahead. Yeah, there we go. So, so we're back on. Um, sure, he's. Are you still running live, Jacob? Okay. So now, looks like most of the businesses are along the shoreline. There are. are These are actually um, homes. The the first street at the top of the businesses. Many of the businesses here are just outside the corner, but the corner is the main. Um, uh, uh, freight route and this parking lot area is all of this town's buildings. And so this area where you show a lot of the the, um, the park like structure mm -hmm. that is partially owned by like a land trust or land. Yeah, so there the land trust people had they had bought up a couple parcels and they're like, well, what do we how do we what do we do with them? Right? What's the highest and best use for our trust, which is protecting the public good and providing public access? And we said, well, you can do this, but really identified also they had, you know, individual homeowners that were kind of worried about the encroaching tides and erosion. And they said, well, if you tell us what we should do with our yard, like we can we can do that and make it make it part of this and also adapt it. And so um, but they also wanted to be thinking about what it would work like they wanted it to work now right often you do the big vision what if everybody moves out and we get all the land that never happens so we kind of made this part what can you do with your the parcels that you have now to achieve those goals reduce risk to the road enhance the beach um, and public access but also you know what if you have your parcels and the town's parcels what if the you know, the guy that owns the corner decides to sell. Um, so they had those different what if scenarios. Uh, that's, it, it just is an interesting. I, I saw that visually and it struck me as being similar to Times Square where we have yeah. multiple business owners and a lot of them, their mm -hmm. structures were actually in the environmentally critical zone already. Yeah. 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 Right. And so you need that flexible path forward. And that, you know, that's, 
very different, you know, different scale and context entity, Eckerd College. They're a college. They're not um, a town. But they, you know, this is I put this. This is their website. Think outside. Like if not, you know, they're in a similar situation. Not only is it like why people want to come to Eckerd for quality of life. They have a world-renowned marine sciences program. They got to be on the water, um, and so we envisioned with them a bunch, you know, I should have just actually put the sketches, you know, different ways that they might start to live with the water in the future, but developed a really um, strategic pathway for how, you know, you were in the situation of building back. They were sort of having lots of buildings approaching the end of the life cycle and wanting to know how they, you know, what do they prioritize adapting first and that and create, you know, a way you know, a pattern book and a guide book for how different, you know, where they build on the campus and where they adapt, but also how they do that so that they, when they do that, they don't lose um, that really connection with the water and the, and the coastal landscape that is Eckerd, right? So this flexible pathway forward, um, you know, but you can take it up to a scale. You know, I, I'm from New York. New York is not the biggest city in the country. Jacksonville, Florida is the biggest city in the country by land area. And it has a lot of challenges. And there it was, how do we bring all the different entities, um, you know, the agents, the different agencies and come together around that, re, that, that adaptation um, and resilience pathway. And so really developed a set of adaptation actions that guided different agencies. And what's critical, you know, look at that first one. It's about grow resiliently. You know, we are in Florida. We're not not growing. We just need to figure out how to grow in a responsible way so that we're not getting, you know, we can bounce forward back next time we have challenges like hurricanes, which are going to happen. Um, but we also develop sort of strategy specific. This is the, we did this for all the different geographies, but the beaches, um, that kind of looked at the geography of risk and what opportunities and paired those to the actions. Um, you know, I think you mentioned Times Square. I think the process that we work with with Pensacola, Florida was really telling, which started with a workshop, a visioning workshop, said what does, what should downtown be? I think that's really where you need to start. But you'll notice, um, and I'll put it here, workshops, but it was a waterfront framework and catalytic projects. Here's a framework, we have a plan, but what are the first three things that we need to do to, to jumpstart, but also to catalyze other investment and catalyze other decisions? So I think that's kind of a really important give and take. And that, you know, the, some of the projects I showed took a while. That workshop was in 2018, 2019. They're breaking ground on a Bruce Beach Park. Um, we're not designing that park. We helped them create the framework and their projects are moving forward. So we hope collaboratively we can help. would like to talk about you know, what you need and what we think the next step would be. I think there's a larger resilience planning process ahead, um, but really understanding where to start with that actionable resilience vision, where, what, what is a thriving Fort Myers Beach? And we can help you vision that and set it on a pathway. And we think you know, the other thing is this, this, is the pro this is from the federal government. This is what they want to see you do to get that resilience funding to fund those projects. So take, embarking on that process is important. And we think that um, you know, you have, we can be partners in that, um, Schenkel Schultz, SCAPE, but have also had some really great conversations with the Collaboratory and U of F and think they could be really important partners in that too. I understand talking to you, so yeah. Go ahead. I just, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for all your help on Fort Myers Beach after the storm and your team. Um, talk a little bit more about how your group and your partnership can help the town of Fort Myers Beach, not only with the vision piece and the implementation of that vision, but talk more specifically about how you, about, about having a group like you, like yours, and what you're trying to, uh, 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 pr what you're proposing today, how can that help us leverage or better leverage federal, state yeah. uh, dollars as well as not-for-profits, uh, NGOs, whatever, uh, think tanks, whatever, whatever, yeah. all these entities out there? Mm -hmm. How can how can having someone with your background and your 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 skill sets, how can that help us leverage dollars for the town? Yeah, I mean, what, we've been through this with a number of different funding sources. You know, the the um, Living Breakwaters was HUD CDBG DR funding. Um, the uh, well, Jacksonville funded that. Um, we've had we've done a lot of pathways, um, and so one of the things is to take 
take that vision, articulate it, tell that story, and pair it with the story that different funding partners are looking for, right? FEMA BRIC, uh, Building Resilient Innovation Communities, they are really about workforce development, economic revitalization. Times Square, finding a strategy that addresses your workforce housing issues, that, that's a great avenue, right, for them. Uh, NIFWIF, National Fish and Wildlife Federation, really have a coastal resilience fund. You think about them doing restoration, but they're really doing adaptation, but they want nature-based infrastructure. It's got to also give back. Your beaches, your uh, the mangroves are really part, could be part of a really important resilience strategy. Those elements align with their funding. So once you have that vision, it's to sort of break it down and really start to match it up to the funding. And I think, you know, the other the other funding sources are the Florida State funding, which I'm less familiar with, but the Jeff Carney at Fiber is really, you know, an expert there. And I mean they're really a trusted partner in terms of what are the steps you have to go through to get that funding. But it really, you know, the biggest thing that I've learned um, is grant writing, funding for these things, it's storytelling. You know, those federal agencies, they want success. They don't want to put money in something that's not going to happen, right? Where there's no vision, where people, like, where they can't see what the end is. And so you want to give, like, give them a win-win too, right? A, a project that's definable, fundable, implementable, and show them you have the partners at the table to get it done and deliver it. Thank you. That's you know, you showed a lot of examples up there. You know, Fort Myers Beach is very unique in, yeah. my, in that it's not just the Fort Myers Beach that makes the decisions. We have the county, we have private landowners, we have private business owners that make up this small little island. How do you navigate those challenges between uh, small homeowners that own the beach up to the wet sand, yeah. um, business owners in Times Square? We own just a small section of that. The county owns on either side of it. You know, you have some of the stuff in the back that's owned by the county. How do you navigate that to be able to come up with an island-wide plan yeah. that can be successful for mitigation funding? Yeah, this is a challenge of any planning process, but in particular resilience and adaptation. There's two, there, there are two reasons it's challenging, right? You have a lot of individual landowners and you need to do something holistic because water doesn't pay attention to, to property boundaries. Um, and the other, you know, the other piece is just that you know, it, it, you're gonna need the, the infrastructure to come together. But that's why I have a number of examples and none of them are exactly Fort Myers Beach because that is a really important part of the, the process early on. And I think getting, you're never gonna get everybody to agree on everything. But you can find a few places, um, a few ideas, three things that people can agree on and get that agreement and buy in there because that is really important. Um, and part of the reason we start with the, like a workshop process is really bringing up everyone to the table and finding those shared passions and investments so that you can get, get some of those quick wins and move some projects forward and getting some implementable successes like you know is it about some infrastructure improvement for Times Square that really benefits everyone and they see the benefit of coming to the table and creating collective action leveraging some funding and then you can set that larger planning process but that really is um, a critical part of adaptation and resilience um, planning and it's it's not easy every every community that's where you are now, that is one of the biggest challenges. And everyone has to confront it differently. So. Questions? I'd, I'd say though, you know, to, to the end, I know the complexity we have, because mm -hmm. so much of our island yeah. is, is, is privately held. And, yeah. um, but I like the, the image you had where you had that place in Nantucket, yeah. where it, how the, the scope of what you did depended on what land you had to do it. Yeah, you so can't. There's, there's no, you need yeah. everybody in Times yeah. Square to agree to a lot of land. Yeah, a lot of people want to come in and do just the vision plan and just, oh, there's only one way. This is the best way. And it's never that. You've, it, you're never going to have all the pieces align. And I think the Nantucket example shows that. But on the other side, it, you know, didn't speak to it too much. But in Jacksonville, that was a really that was a really big challenge. And one of the things that they did in conjunction with the resilience plan is they are now updating their land development code. 
So in parallel with that, they're taking those things and saying, okay, what is the guide? How does this translate into the guidance that we're giving to individual um, property owners and developers? And they had a lot of roundtables with developers say, okay, well, we can't just tell you what you can't do. What can we tell you that you can do so that it's a give and take? Because we want you to come to build. Like we have a house, they had a housing a real you know, housing crisis in, in Jacksonville, but they wanted to make sure that that housing was getting built in areas that weren't like wetlands that were gonna flood and create um, challenges there. And so it really that give and take and dialogue is really key when you're talking about the, the scale of the private property and then the infrastructure. Um, on the other side, the other thing is working in communities where you know you don't control all of your infrastructure or decisions right some are state or some are lee county roads and one of the things that we work with a lot of entities it's particularly uh, true with a lot of institutions is really identifying what are the things that you have control over and that you can move and do and then what are the ones where you have to influence and advocate and really differentiating between those projects and points of intervention so that you can move targeted projects forward and have the lot like more of the nuanced collaboration when it's you know well okay lee county this is what we need you to do for us so question i mean how does this whole process work i mean from start to finish and the timing yeah. is and the length of time mm -hmm. is really critical as yeah. well and the cost yeah um, I, you know uh, a island-wide resilience planning process I mean Jim should I said this or not um, you know I, I'm gonna be honest I'd say it's gonna take six months to a year to do that whole process but that doesn't mean it takes that time to get a quick win. I think one of the things to start with is a workshop. One, it's really important. Uh, you, Dan, you, you acknowledge like Fort Byers Beach is unique. I'm not gonna come in and tell you this is the exact way you should do it. We need to sit down and have a conversation and workshop through it. And I think that you know, that's something we could do in the first couple months of the new year, right? Come down for a few days, like, work through it come out of that with some sketches some some identification okay town times square that's if that's where we want to work and focus let's you know let's move some ideas for that forward so i think you can have sort of you can have early wins but that larger process of really defining what it means to thrive doing the risk and vulnerability assessment and creating a framework is going to take a little longer and you can do it quicker and faster or a little longer but i think Generally, from my experience, that's uh, that larger process is usually a six to twelve month process, and part of that is making sure you get your ducks in a row about the, you know, any engagement or risk and vulnerability assessment that those federal grants or state grants are going to ask you to have, um, and that's where I think you know folks like U of F and the collaboratory can kind of come in as a partnership. Don't don't be scared by that. You want to get your ducks in a row to to bring in the real funding. And. Just get another kind of point now, and I'm, I don't want to get too much into detail about this, but the hazard mitigation grant funding that you can use to acquire uh, frequently mm -hmm. affected lands, um, my understanding is that those have to be made into natural lands. Now, one of the things that's intriguing about some of the projects you said is you, you, you use the coastal land to come up with ways to do wave attenuation, yeah. things like this, so they actually... not They're not just a natural buffer, they also have structure in them um, is that allowed under the hazard mitigation grant funding? I I don't think so in that one. That okay. that particular funding stream is not something I can stand. Like, I know people who can answer that question, but it's not something I can stand up here and answer accurate, like precisely. I don't think I get it right. Um, but there is a range um, when we talk about natural and nature-based features. You can go, you know. There's still a range within that, and um, you know, layering up strategies that might leave some parcels but allow develop like development on the next inland adjacent parcel. There's ways that you can think about that, but that's the other piece. If if really figuring out what the technical risk is to some of those and where you should develop or not, that's a part we have, you know work with coastal engineers and modelers that help us really understand 
that, and that can be a really important step in, in um, guiding development to low-risk locations where you know that you're going to have the most likelihood to survive. A lot of it, as I think you found and we found in many communities, has to do with the, um, the quality and type of building, right? You have two houses next to each other, and one did fine and one didn't. Let's learn from that, too. So, What, uh, this ballpark, how, how does this work with urban planners? Yeah. Is it something that is funded through grants, or is it something the town, in this case, would pay for? Yeah, I mean, and roughly, what does something like this cost? You said this goes yeah, it, years. It, and, again, it's it's so scalable, and I really hate would hate to kind of put a number on the table that maybe I I know you want to know one. Um, but I think it's important it can, for us to know because yeah, yeah. one, nobody's really said anything about what it yeah. costs, and and I think that is going to have mm -hmm. a large. Yeah. Effect on so, whether or not this is yeah. something that the town can actually do. I think it should be a two phase thing. I think you should start with a, you know, like a, a targeted workshop, um, you know, with us, with the collaboratory. Something like that could be like 20 or 30K. Like, do that. But you want enough that you invest the time. You, get, you don't just get like a, hey, we met with you and we walked away. You want some, some sketches, some drawings. You want the scope of work for that larger resilience planning effort. That larger effort, you know, I've seen a lot of RFPs come out. I've done a lot of plans. It's really going to depend on how much um, site analysis or engineering that you want. But I've been hard pressed to see a good one done for less than like two or three, two hundred or three hundred k. And I've seen them be, you know, eight hundred, you know, or almost a million dollar efforts. So it's a huge range. But I think that, you know, I think getting something in the ground. Um, sooner is probably important. And, and, I th I think and is there any sort of subsidies out there through grants or whatever mm -hmm. to help offset some of those costs? Yeah, a lot. Um, I mean, it, the part of it's the chicken and egg thing, right? Like, you want to get the plan to get the, the funding, but there are, you know, I, I, I've worked in a lot more of the um, nature-based resilience, but like the, the NIFWF Coastal Resilience Fund funds that I do believe there are brick funding. What we've seen historically, like when we were coming out of Sandy, there were no federal government, like there were no federal or grant uh, state funding that fund resilience plans, right? But now everyone said, oh gosh, the ones that did the pre-development that had the resources, that was good. So there, there are many more sources for that. And that's something that we could, that's something that we could put together. I would also say that, you know, the collaborative, you know, I think you could leverage it like it could be a partnership like we could come in and do part of it but part of that legwork particularly around the risk and vulnerability assessments that are pretty systematic and outreach could be done in partnership with the collaboratory and fiber and it's my understanding that be, uh, because of their they would fund that they would fund themselves so yeah, i don't I want to speak for jim but i think that's what he said right <laughs> i think i think that i was i was told from the collaboratory when they brought fiber in the yeah. collaboratory mm -hmm. had a grant yeah, so they were willing yeah. to apply to mm -hmm. fiber at that time. So, yeah, some, sometimes if you're, some groups come mm -hmm. with funding and some. Yeah, and I think that's a really that's an important thing for the resources of so the academic partners. I, I, you know, you take take what you will. I think having a professional partner is important too, um, to with both of those together. But I think those can complement and and make the cost lower. You know, you talk about collaboration. It, it, for me, the biggest concern that I see with this is if we move forward with something like this, I think it should be in concert with the county, quite yeah. honestly, because yeah. the infrastructure that you referred to, Estero Boulevard, is their road. Uh, a lot of Times Square, around Times yeah. Square, is, is their property. The north end of the island, the, yeah. I mean, the, a I lot would, of this is there. I would hate to see the town and its constituents in, invest a lot of money in something and come up with a plan that the island feels is very good and very you know sustainable and meets all the mitigation requirements and that to only find out that it's not really the vision that the county had yeah so do you have any projects that with the county are you currently in negotiations with the county to to do some of this work we're we're not um we haven't i mean you you may we talked to the economic um development director do you want to, yeah, yeah. I mean, we i mean we work in lee county um, obviously, Schinkel Schultz, different projects, but we don't have any. We don't have a specific project like this with the county. We do understand that you have to have them at the table, and that is part of. I mean, I, I think the two-step process makes the most sense. Like, like Pippa was explaining, because you you kind of create that uh, quick 
workshop and you don't invest in the long term without having all the players at the table in, in agreement. Um, but because you're right, you can't, you, this wouldn't really make sense without their um, involvement. I think as um, part, yeah, as part of an initial um, thing, I would say sit down with the county and talk about their involvement because I, I'm impressed that I've worked with a lot of communities that don't recognize that right away. And I feel like I'm advising everyone, okay, like who owns your road? Make sure they're in at the table. So that is that acknowledging that now is really important. And I think what you'd want to do is as part of this initial conversation is get the get the county on board and have them commit to participation in that planning process, right? So say, hey, we're gonna embark on this visioning plan. We need you to have your staff meet with us and review our like where we are once a month through this process because we don't want to come out at the end and you tell us that this doesn't work. Um, and that I think is a really important thing to build into the scope and that's where every place is unique. But that's, that's usually a, the plans that do that early are better than the ones that don't because <laughs> you don't want to sell on a shelf. Huh. Doesn't, that doesn't do you any good. Thank you. Any other questions for Pippa or Natalie? And I just, I say, you know, it's pretty astute, Dan, about, you know, getting the county involved. I do think, though, that I'd like to, you know, someone's got to drive the bus. Yeah. Oh, sure. You want to drive the bus. <laughs> beep, beep. Well, we certainly thank you for your time yeah. and, and, and very good information. It looks like you do very good work. So um, thank you. we have some decisions yeah. I think we have to make with staff and, and obviously talk to the county and, and see if we can get everybody to the table. Because uh, I think it's, as you said, it's very important to have that initial meeting. Mm -hmm. They need to be sitting there as well. Yeah. Well, thank you right. so much for letting us talk. Apologize again for bringing the cold weather. and uh... <laughs> We won't hold it against you. Take it with you. Thank you. All right. Next we have the Town Council Policies and Procedures. It's the annual review of the Town Council Policies and Procedures. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, the next item, yes, it is um, a review uh, that council directed uh, us to complete regarding the existing policies and procedures which were adopted not too long ago, I believe in or, or last revised back on um, March the 20th of 2023. Um, since that time, however, um, at our prior meeting, we did have some conversation about Form 6, which is referenced in those uh, policies and procedures, and I think I brought to the attention of Council, there was some recent case law that would have um, precipitated some additional changes. So we were directed to go and take a look at um, the currently adopted procedures, and we did some redlining in it. Um, really, the two major uh, substantive issues are uh, referencing the Form 6 as well as um, the recognition, and, and let me just go ahead and, and talk about that case law real quick, is that um, sometimes uh, individuals can become disruptive in a meeting and due process requires us to give them notice that if their disruptive conduct is not um, stopped that they would be asked to to leave the room rather than simply saying um, please get up and leave because you're being disruptive so you know due process gives them that opportunity to correct their behavior um, so those I, in my opinion I think are the two real substantive issues there was a lot of changes that we made just to kind of clarify some of the language in uh, your existing rules and policy and procedures also, I did sit with your city, your town clerk, and we went through and we noticed that the current order um, of your agenda materials that are presented, um, that was a little bit out of order, so we, we made that correction as well. Um, we also added, um, which I want to bring to your attention, um, what the town requirements are um, in Section 2, uh, which would be page nine is where it begins it talks about the town council mission and job description and then on the subsequent page on page 10 it talks about council members requirements so there we did reference the uh, requirement to file the um, form six but we also added uh, a requirement that was 
embedded in um, a latter part of the rules and procedures, which was the completion of your ethics training, uh, which you do already, but we just kind of moved that as well. Um, so that's kind of my overview of it. Um, I'm open to any questions you may have um, concerning the changes that we have made or, or any other questions in general. Are there any questions for Nancy? It seems pretty straightforward. So it looks like everything in blue was just kind of moved from one section that is correct. to another. I, I, have a, I have a sort of a philosophical question, Nancy, given all your experience, and Becky's experience in so many other communities around Florida. And, and this may be a charter issue, and maybe, maybe we can address some of it uh, uh, at the uh, policy and procedures level, but I think one of the, and we worked through it uh, this past year and a half, I think appropriately so, but we have such a strong uh, town manager system, and when we, as we went through the hurricane, post-hurricane, we had uh, a, a couple transitions within the uh, town manager position, and the mayor assumed in essence, from a practical standpoint, at, at, at many times, the role of the town manager, and again, appropriately so. And I just wonder if we should figure out a way, and I've looked at it a little bit, but I just, with your experience, if any other communities have, and maybe that fall falls under the state of emergency dynamic, but it seems like we ought to build into our, either our charter or our rules and procedures, some kind of a dynamic for that unique situation in an emergency situation where the the mayor assumes a more traditional mayoral role uh, in, in an emergency situation, uh, particularly if, again, the town manager position is is not stable. Um, just, I want you to kind of chew on that with Becky and think about it and see if we need to build anything into our our rules and procedures and or our charter just to make sure we, and again, we, we sort of manage through it, but I'm not sure our our process we just did it, and I'm not sure our process or our charter or our rules and procedures fully gave us the support to do what we did, even though I think it was appropriate we did what yes. we did. Um, you did identify the two uh, major sources of possible authority uh, to go forward with that. One would be in the charter, and I have seen that in other city charters where it talks about that. However, you do have the emergency order, and that is another place where you know the mayor could fulfill that order um, that you know assume those duties in that state just something to for you and Becky to intellectually chew on a little bit uh, yeah. see if there's any it, it, it maybe we don't need to do anything but I just want you to think about it a little bit yeah. um, sometimes too if the uh, authority is delegated to the town manager um, in the absence of the town manager what happens and so you kind of have a, a pecking order um, along those lines almost I've like a that. line of succession yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think that would be In worth thinking about it as well yeah. yeah yeah and I do I understand what you're saying um, Jim of course you know there's a very distinct forms of government between the strong mayor and a weak mayor <laughs> and, and and not just in the authority that's given to the mayor the mayor is actually the town manager but then essentially the town manager is elected by the general public and not selected and there's also compensation to go with the extra work that someone does so um, I'd be interested to see what the attorneys can come up with, but I, it's, it seems to be a pretty complicated situation, and hopefully we'll never never have that kind of emergency where we go through so many mayors and town managers in a short period of time after a hurricane. Well, again, I, I, I don't disagree, and, and just because it's complicated I, I, it doesn't mean we shouldn't look at it. I think what happened, uh, being a coastal community, I think... Uh, and somebody needs to let the mayor know that the compensation needs to be <laughs> adjusted because he was working an, a base, not only a full-time job, but working overtime at a full-time job uh, at very modest uh, compensation for, for, for the last year and a half, put in just crazy hours. Uh, and, and, but, but at the same time, I just want to make sure that in that state of emergency, the mayor institutionally has the authority that he needs in the rules and procedures and in the in charter to step into that role without anybody. Fortunately, we had a, a very civil uh, 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 council that worked together. Uh, but at the same time, if somebody challenges that or some citizen would litigate against that, I just want to make sure we institutionally have some, some, some safeguards built in where that mayor is protected 
uh, and, and, and empowered to do what uh, he or she needs to do in that time of emergency. Just, again, uh, with their experience in other communities, maybe some other community has figured this out, and I'm not saying we need to reinvent the wheel. Just I would encourage us to look at that because we all say it'll never happen again, and we pray that it doesn't, but, but now's the time to, make, to institutionalize those changes that protect us in the future in case, God forbid, something ever happened again. So we can we can definitely look at it and uh, give it some research that it uh, would require. Um, however, you know, if in a state of emergency the uh, authority is delegated to the town manager, the town manager could, in his discretion, ask the mayor for assistance. Um, and it is not uncommon to have, in a state of an emergency, having the town manager and the mayor, or sometimes even the vice mayor, to work hand in hand day to day um, just to get the community through that that crisis situation and i'm also going to be interesting because i think you know the day-to-day -day operations it seems like i you know i'm not going to speak for you dan but a lot of what dan was doing was interfacing with other governmental entities from the state to the county to um, aid agencies to, to lots of other things uh, be, it'd be good to kind of bookmark that but i do think if if we give any kind of discretion to the mayor in this circumstance that would veer into what I would consider policy, that that is either ratified or brought through town council. Yeah, we'll look into it. You know, the one other thing that I think um, we don't address in any of this is the values and culture and how we um, perform in our day-to-day -day life as a leader leaders of the town and also as our town council our town staff we've talked about it a lot and putting things in writing but we still don't have that all-encompassing vision of values and culture and a couple little things i went through this uh, nancy one is um okay on page 32 of the packet um, there's the there's a mention in there. What number was that? Uh, where you're you're talking about kind of similar circumstances where you have you're, you're selecting a town manager, and uh, and the term was <coughs> the then current town manager. Um, I it, it just didn't roll off the tongue. Is it even clear? I went with maybe the better like the current acting town manager, or um, is it maybe a more clear way to. To put that sure that would be um, again if you can it's page 32 the interview selection process of the town manager that is the citation right right, right. yeah we'll, we'll look at that language um, today is a workshop so for this to be adopted it will have to come back to you at a regular meeting and uh, we can make whatever changes you would like um, at that time and um, there are a couple of little things um, yeah, the little typo on uh, number four on page 27 where instead of addition, it has sedition. <laughs> and on that same page, number 11, um, there's a list of things that happen, and I assume that the chronology is in the, is in the order. And there's one place in there where you say next, um, which I just think grammatically <coughs> it seems to be, it's already implied that the order of the, um, in everything else, there's not a next. Okay. You know, looking at that interview process as well for town manager, um, I think we should get rid of the coffee and muffins referral to that <laughs> and just have public Donuts? meeting or something a little bit higher level than coffee and muffins. Have you been, uh, I don't want to, you know, question any ethics, but have you been influenced by the pro-donut wing of the... <laughs> donuts, uh, donuts, donuts, or maybe it's donuts. donuts and fruit. I don't know, but I think we can no elevate offense, that part of the schedule. <laughs> How about just public meeting? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, now, and a couple things I wouldn't mind discussing is I made a couple points here, things that I thought were um, kind of relevant. Uh, now, one is on page 12, uh, number six is about gifts. And um, now we have our rules with our policies and procedures and then the state has their rules and which have more legal weight to them. I mean, with us, it's really, if someone violates these policies and procedures, if it's, it's, if it's egregious, then the council can vote them out. But it seems like that is, that is unlikely to happen, unless it's really bad. 
So I just wonder if you're going to discuss, um, discuss gifts and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, I'm sorry, what is the reference Page specifically? 12, number 6. Number 6, okay. So there's um, a couple levels. Um, basically, uh, if it's up to $25, um, it's considered somewhat nominal, um, not enough to influence any type of official action um, that might be undertaken by that um, to benefit that individual who's providing the gift. Um, the next tier is basically from the $25 up through, I guess, $99.99, uh, where you could arguably uh, accept a gift in that uh, dollar amount. However, the individual providing it, assuming they are a reporting individual uh, as a lobbyist, they would have to report um, the fact that that gift was provided, um, uh, again, it, the obligation is on their part, not on your part. However, if the gift is $100 or more, um, then uh, you are prohibited under the state law from accepting that gift. Um, we can spend time talking about a gift, what constitutes a gift. Um, in number six, you see some examples um, it could be a loan, a payment, a favor. Um, you know, they talk about meals, transportation, or anything else of value. Um, and then it's also not only to you, but also to your spouse and immediate family. And um, and the other thing, the other kind of word here is, you know, and the understanding or possibility that it will influence the official action of members um, during town council procedure. Um, so. I mean, because, you know, we're a small town, and we're friends with a lot of people in the town. So if I go to my friend Bob's house and he gives me a beer and then later on he comes in front of council, that could potentially be seen as a violation? Well, it, the value of that beer, I would hope it's maybe under $25. I mean, that's like a single no. setting. Um, and the question then, too, is, you know, uh, the language about will it actually influence the official action? It's beer, this particular, the application of the gift law, and I think Becky has advised you as well that there is a 12-month look back. Um, it's very fact-specific driven. Um, you know, yes, you had a beer with them, but, you know, when, when did they come before you to ask for something? Were you influenced by that beer when you made your decision? I mean, there could have been a lot of other things that were presented that caused you to vote in a particular way. Now, but one of the lines I'm thinking about, well, a couple of things. One is because in our policy and procedure, there is no monetary value at all. The 25 and the 100 is a state thing, right? Correct. We are, we're, we're, so our, by, by definition, we're stricter um, because we don't have any dollar value. Is that a fair no. interpretation? <laughs> Technically, except it does say, um, it does reference no 80, 286. I mean, if you want to... Um, you know, you would think, well, excuse me, not 286, it's, it's the, um, the Florida Ethics Code. Um, I mean, if you want to make that uh, inclusion, you can, you can be more stricter if you, if you yeah. choose to. Well, I'm just, and, and you know, when I'm, when I'm reading this, I see that there's first, there's the first half of that paragraph is about members shall not accept, a, accept or solicit a gift and blah, blah, blah. Um, if there's an understanding of the possibility of influence, there's no like over $25 or over $100 in that particular section. So that to me says that our policy and procedure said there's, there's a zero threshold to that. And then there's state law, which has other criteria, which we're, even if it isn't in here, we're, 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 um, we have to comply to the state law. Um, and I wonder, maybe we could either just bring them together somehow well, can well, I offer a suggestion? Because I agree with Councillor Veach. I think there's a lot of confusion there. I, I, I would suggest that we mirror state guide, guidelines okay. uh, and take all that additional rhetoric because, and I say that because, not because of this council, because uh, the civility here is great. I, 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 ha I am a student of, of other councils around this state and country and other uh, forms of and other uh, governmental organizations and that kind of vagueness can be used to weaponize against fellow colleagues and so forth. And, and, it, and, and fortunately, the, 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 
the to people don't see it here because there's really no toxicity, but you look at, and I'm sure Nancy has had some experience with some of these toxic councils. I, I think if we stick by the uh, state guidelines, it's very clear, it's consistent, it's what everyone has to go by, and we don't have these vagaries in there, then, then and it's hard to believe with this group because we all get along pretty well, but there are councils where the, the tensions are so high where they're looking for anything, any kind of weapon to use against each other, and it's very unhealthy. So I think the clearer it is, and the more consistent it is with the state, I think that it will serve us all well in the long run. Uh, fortunately, we all get along, uh, but at the same time, I've seen other, other situations where it becomes very toxic, and any weapon that can be utilized against a colleague is utilized, and, and it creates tremendous dysfunction. Nancy, would you agree? I, I would agree. And, um, you know, the statute, the wording in the statute is such, and as I just mentioned, um, the application of the gift law is very fact specific. So in addition to the language that's in the statute, you have all the case law that has been and opinions that have been rendered by the State Ethics Commission, and that will help guide whatever issue or question comes up. So um, I completely wholeheartedly support that recommended change if, if council is okay with that. The other thing I wanted to point out, um, recently I had an experience with uh, a different municipality talking about solicitating, solicitating a gift. Um, there's been an interpretation that if the gift or the loan, or it wouldn't be a loan, but uh, the gift or the monetary was for the benefit of the town, then that's a little different than soliciting on your own behalf. And um, I think that, that that may not be crystal clear there as well. So again, So, so like if, if Jim is, is asking for donations for a, the Veterans Memorial or something yeah. like that, that's yeah, for the town, like it's not for him. It's not for him, yeah. exactly. So um, again, there's some state guidance on that, and so I think deferring back to the state uh, for that it, for that um, direction would be the best policy. And um, what about if someone is soliciting a gift for like a nonprofit, which we all do fairly regularly? Again, it's fact specific. Is the nonprofit coming before you uh, for any type of decision? Um, it, there's also the issue of perception. You know, sometimes there might not be a specific violation of the ethics code, but it's the perception. You know, um, hypothetically, an individual is always asking, always asking, always asking. Um, and, and so, and, and just to kind of, kind of, a couple of, of scenarios to me, is it if I have, if I'm in a social engagement you know, casual thing and, and with some other resident and, you know, we're going to someone's house for dinner or something. Um, the kind of, to me, that implication is this is just a social thing. But now if you have a developer who's taking you out to dinner, who is going to come in front of town council, then to me that... Completely different, yes. And, and again, that's why it's fact-based. However, that individual, the, the residential property owner, they may have a situation where they do have to come before you for something. Um, so you just have to, uh, you know, assuming the role of, as an elected public official is, is not all fun sometimes. It seems like one of the real gray areas is, is it almost seems like you have to prove intent. You know, so if, like you, like you said, I'm out my neighbor's Bob's, and he, he just mentions during the evening that he's going to come in front of council with the variance and wants my support, you know, I mean... Is that the intent of, of so the So then it goes invitation? to your, your risk tolerance. <laughs> um, again, it's, sometimes it's the perception, and the perception can leave, lead to um, an ethics complaint, which then could be very um, timely and, and costly, just to prove that you did nothing wrong. So, uh, you know, what is your risk tolerance? Do you prefer to be more conservative and just kind of avoid those situations or um, engage to where you, do, you come to the line but you don't cross it? And then at that point, you really need to have a great understanding of what, where that line is, and that's why the four hours of ethics every <laughs> year is important. Because, um, as I mentioned, you know, there is evolving case law from the State Ethics Commission, and it's based on facts. So maybe this year there's nothing that is specific to that situation, but over the course of the next year, maybe there is a case that's brought before them that would give more guidance 
in that situation. Another question, I'm sure this will probably come up in the ethics training, but um, the, the $25, $25 is, is the reporting threshold, right? And then $100 is when you, you shouldn't accept gifts. Is that, in, is that an aggregate or is that a single event? So the lawyer answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> again, it's, it's kind of a, a fact-based scenario. Um, so when you do encounter those issues, I mean, I, Becky's available, I'm available, um, but more importantly, I'd like to say the, um, the State Ethics Commission, they have attorneys on staff. Um, Becky and I can have an opinion. However, we are not the ones that have the authority to impose any type of punishment or sanction on you. Um, so I can give you my opinion, but my recommendation is always to just touch base with the, um, the Ethics Commission. And they're very happy to do that because they like to know what kind of issues um, are occurring in local governments, what kind of problems are they facing, uh, such as the requirement to fill out Form 6. <laughs> um, and I will tell you, I want to go ahead and, and share with all of you that I did attend a, um, a seminar a couple of weeks ago where I had a personal conversation with the general counsel for the Ethics Commission, and I told him that this Form 6 requirement is is really very, very burdensome on our local officials. Um, and he allowed me to uh, let you know that he would be open to any com uh, telephone calls that you may have specific to how to fill out that form. So after the meeting, if you'd like to make that phone call, I can give you his contact information. I just did a, a session yesterday with the League of Cities, uh, t uh, Cities and Towns for Florida on the... Uh, on the new financial disclosure form, and I would encourage my colleagues to prepare because it's uh, it is it, it, it's it's very uh, complicated and it's very extensive, and that's all fine. But I just think from a uh, preparation standpoint, it's uh, it's a whole new world, and uh, it's it's if you thought doing your income taxes were, were, was challenging, <laughs> this is uh, equally challenging, if not more challenging, particularly uh, those of you who are blessed with extensive resources so it's uh it's it's worth taking some time to do some of these trainings because it's a uh, it's a big deal and i assume we're gonna are we gonna touch on form six separately or is that because then you have another whole no handout. um i think we should do that i think we should do that another day it's it's a huge uh, yes. discussion and, in and of itself and working with amy um she also listened to the seminar i also did i think some of you others have as well but we did provide you with i think a handout of what was distributed there. The speakers had extensive um, accounting uh, experience and were also uh, elected officials. So they kind of see it from both sides and there was a lot of detail lot. Um, as far as, um, I mean it went so far as to if you have crypto coins or crypto assets, um, you know, how do you disclose those? They talked about child support, um, yeah, that was, inter a, that was a interesting variety that, that alimony is considered an income you have to report, but child support is not. Not that any of those are a factor for me personally, but um, that was interesting. Yeah, I, I, I would suggest as we get closer to the deadline that we have a, a group session on this, but, but now it takes too much. It's, it's, even the people at the forum yesterday were debating with each other as to what what to do and how to interpret it. And so I, some of this is going to shake out, I think, yes, over the next few weeks. Yes, and we did, um, Amy contacted the league yesterday, and they advised, not only did they provide us with the handouts to give to you, but they said that the video would be available on their website. Um, and, I, yes, I agree with, with all of you that you should definitely take a look at that. And so, so back to item six, I think it's important. I, I do agree with kind of aligning with the state, but I think it's important that um, us as a town council that we, we 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 keep the appearance of being impartial because another another part of that is is one of the um, one of the things in here is that when we do ex parte mm -hmm. that we we have this um, we're basically saying we had some kind of communication but isn't it true that everything that our decision is supposed to be based on just what's presented to us during the hearing that is correct and um also, I believe that we are asking if you have any conflict of interest um, or even if you have a bias. Um, it, the whole issue of ex parte disclosures is to 
retain the fundamental fairness of that proceeding for the property owner applicant. Um, because if you've had conversations, um, you've gone to the site, you've seen things, you have a conflict, they need to know about that. And um, you make your disclosure. They also have the opportunity to ask you a little bit more. Um, you know, if you say that you visited the site, they may ask you, well, when did you visit the site? Was it the day that it rained or was it the day that it was sunny? Um, because that might influence um, the disclosure that you've made. What facts did you walk away with that are not currently before, um, you know, or that are not currently being presented in the, in the proceeding? And, and that's one of, the, one of the things that I find a little um, troublesome right now is that I understand the developers, particularly if they're going to make a purchase, they want to do due diligence. And part of their due diligence is see if they think they can get what they need to do the development that, that they're acquiring the property for. Um, so we have that, but that seems to me to conflict with the idea that then when you're in the quasi-judicial hearing, that whatever you had a conversation with, with these developers should not be a part of your decision. It's what's presented at the, uh, at the hearing. Well, it kind of goes to the extent of your disclosure. Um, again, the applicant might ask questions. Um, let's say that the conversation was with um, a neighbor rather than the developer. The developer has the developer applicant or property owner, whoever it may be, that is um, asking for the request to you. They may ask a little bit further. So you spoke with Mr. Jones. What was the extent of your conversation? Um, did you walk away with any preconceived notion? Um, are you able to still be an impartial decision maker in this, or have you now made your mind up before the hearing? Um, so they have that opportunity to ask a little bit more regarding um, your ex parte disclosures. And this would be the applicant has that, the ability to ask that. Yes, because we want to make sure that the applicant has um, a fair proceeding, that, that mm -hmm. you don't come with um, extra information that's not present um, during that discussion. I would think there was more than just the applicant. It's also because, you know, if the, it, it, you, you could argue that if, you, if the applicant gets an advantage from this, then they are not being harmed by it, but then it's still biasing the process if they want to make that argument I mean. um and i just think i'm, I'm doing this i think it's, it's important i know the changes she made but i just think it's important to have conversations about some of the points in here um that the three of us have been through before but it's probably newer to the the two newer members um the other thing is and i was Changes made to page 11, number one. It says, um, members shall not convey the impression that they can influence the outcome of a decision of town council or shall not attempt to use their office to direct or influence um, staff recommendations of the town manager or the town attorney without concurrence of town council. So I'm going to have an example, and this has happened to a lot of us where someone is having a problem with a permit or um, or there's, they've got some kind of fine they don't understand. Um, a lot of us in council have been the advocate of people who come with problems. Um, now, usually what I do is I'll, I'll make sure I just, I'll, I'll, I'll copy the town manager directly on, on a response. But where is there, is, is I mean, I, I was thinking the town manager essentially works for us, but he works for us as a whole. Right, he works for us as a group, not as individual um, councilmen. So where, where is that crossing the line if we have a constituent who has an issue and we are trying to get that resolved for them? Um, the line is not identified in your procedures, um, so it's really discretionary. But I think what this is intended to do is to really make sure that um, you work through either the town manager or the town attorney and not directly um, with staff and that you don't give us direction without the body as a whole giving us direction to to do something uh, for instance uh, we would not on our own draft an ordinance because one of you have asked us to draft an ordinance uh, we would have to bring it back and make sure that all of you were 
in agreement that we were moving forward with that ordinance. Now, the, the change you made to one where you added the town manager or town attorney as, as, as someone who we should not um, try to influence, to me that seems to be a little, uh, I, I don't, I, you know, I can understand not, not trying to influence staff directly because that's the town manager's job, mm -hmm. but we have frequent conversations with the town manager and... Right, but w I mean, I know we generally will not take um, action until we come back and make sure that it is the direction that, um, that the town council wants us to go, and I think Andy is, is of the same mind. Okay, and the other thing, um, a lot about electronic communications. And so we did this changes, oh uh, boy. I, it's fairly early up in the process, I think, here, in the document. Um, we have email and texting policy. Yeah, that's that fairly up. 13 and 14. Yeah. Um, we added, um, as part of best practices, we added uh, sending an email reply all when more, more than one council member is also on the email that was received. And I'm gonna, sp specifically, there is about using your phone's electronic communications during meetings. Okay. And um, I just like to kind of, there's a, there's a couple of gotchas there. Like one is I understand because, especially if you're in like a quasi-judicial hearing, you're essentially having an anonymous witness if you're texting about whatever it is the hearing is about. Um, so I understand like specifically quasi-judicial but I think our, our policies basically say you should refrain from using your phones for electronic communication during a meeting unless it's an emergency. And um, the, other, the other question I have. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let, let's, let's say that again. The, remember, we went through this before, Jim, uh, and this is something that we put in the last council, that you should refrain from using your, your doing electronic communications during a meeting and the, the the carve out that we had, unless it's somebody who is um, telling you that the system is not working and they can't hear you, I don't. I don't remember it being that restrictive. I remember the concern about in a in a in a in a in a, in a semi judicial proceeding, but I don't remember because. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I get texts all the time from people during the meeting. Sometimes it's personal. Sometimes it's work related. Sometimes it's, and we, we're here for five, six, eight hours at times. So we're not going to use our phones for seven. I mean, some of I have a consulting business. I mean, I mean, how can you? I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with not being able to utilize our phone for six hours. Just thinking, just from my perspective. Well, and I think you know, um, and I understand that. But the thing is, when you're using your phone, it's it's no one knows what it is you're communicating about or with, and that could be prejudicial to it, like a hearing. No, no, I, I'm with you on the hearing piece, but, but our, most of our, our meetings are not all hearings. In fact, the majority of the time is not spent in a, in a, in a quasi-judicial hearing. So uh, if, if someone's literally giving you testify in a, a testimony in a quasi-judicial hearing, I, I, I get that, respect that. But in a regular meeting, when we're here for four, six, eight hours a day, not to be able to utilize your phone during that time, particularly some of us who are still working, I, 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 don't, I don't think that's a good... I don't think that's fair. Uh, I, you know, certainly want to be respectful to our to our role here, but at the same time, there are people who will want to reach you during the day uh, for a variety of reasons. I, I just I, I would not support that. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, here, number four on page twelve says, "No member shall communicate, receive, send, or solicit any private, written, telephonic, or electronic communications during a town council meeting unless it pertains to an emergency situation." Example, audio or video feed of council meeting not working properly. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that, and I'd like to see that change. I appreciate, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention, because I, I did not. Well, and it's interesting, Jim, because I think that the whole, that carve-out was something you put in. Because I think at the time, uh, that was before we put the new system in, and it was, it was a frequent issue. Um, but the other thing about using your, using your phone... Uh, during a meeting, now this is not during a break, right? During when the meeting is, is in session, is you're also inattentive and you could be communicating on something that, that could be um, prejudicial. And the other thing is I, I'm not sure what the implication is for public records because if you're doing something on your personal phone during a, during a meeting, where does that cross the line to being a public record and someone could do a public records request and, and have the town go through all your 
poor Amy go through all your text messages to see what's relevant? Well, well I, I would just say just from just my own life experience here is that oftentimes I'm on my phone doing casework or help doing constituent work. Again, you're here for six uh, uh, hours at a time, and there are people that have time-sensitive issues. They're working on issues. They want a response. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think that's too extensive. I, I, I think we, we certainly ought to show respect for our role and our constituents by not sitting here staring at your phone through the whole meeting. But there are situations where you've got a, a work situation, a personal situation. Again, six hours of your day to put your phone aside. Uh, I, I think there's a healthy balance there. I think we all have, we're adults, we have common sense, we have respect for our constituents, but at the same time, not to be able to, to respond quickly to a work uh, situation or even a constituent situation uh, for that period of time uh, seems unreasonable to me. I'd, I'd be curious uh, to my colleagues' opinion on that. Well, I, I can tell you one thing is I, we don't necessarily sit in one place for six hours. There are breaks, you know, we all, we all I, I don't think um, I have the physical capacity to sit necessarily for six hours and not, not take breaks. So I think that I, I'm, I'm open to kind of expanding this, maybe having certain roles, but I think that during a meeting, I think your, 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 your attention is, is paramount and through all of it. And when you are on your phone, you're not, you're not engaged and you, you're distracted from it. Um, I think there may be certain situations where it's feasible, but I also think that we do have breaks that that can be used and if we need to take more breaks to be able to create enough room for that i'd be more in favor of that than saying that um that you know when someone's up there giving testimony you're on your phone and you're not paying attention to them well that's 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 that, that's a fair position i just i just disagree because some of us are still working and and uh, we have lives outside of of the council and and again we certainly want to be as respectful as we can uh, throughout the meeting, but at the same time there are situations that arise where they're time sensitive and you've got to respond and you can do it quickly and respectfully and I just I think that's an unfair burden to put on public servants. And I think in any job people are expected to multitask. You know the, <clears throat> where the exactly is this verbiage? Is the, <clears throat> um, page twelve number four at the top of the page. On the page twelve in the packet. No one, has, no one has any control on if someone sends you something. I That's mean, right. You've got the word receive in there. I mean, there's four of us sitting up here with computers open. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we look at this stuff electronically. You get notifications that you got an email, and sometimes I respond to them, sometimes I wait till after the meeting. But um, I, I, I agree with both of you, quite honestly. I think there's a, a, there's a, a balance in here that could be rewritten yeah. to, be, to maybe be a little bit more open again re we can't control if someone sends us a message we can't control if someone sends us an email well um, you can't control on whether and, and when you respond to that email oh and, certainly and, and, and sometimes i mean yes in most cases you can wait till break or do whatever in some cases it may be an emergency and you cannot and there's you know there is there is a carve out here for emergency situations and certainly I've been in a situation where I've had a meeting, like we have, you know, we have the, the, the thing coming on after this, where council's running late, and I had to let them know that I was going to be late for the meeting. I mean, those, those kind of things. I think creating carve-outs, the other thing is, uh, is, is, for my mind, is if it really is an emergency, and it's not just chit-chat, or it's not just something about someone watching on, on TV and making their comments, which is something I think you really want to avoid, then um, you, know, you can always leave the room and, and you know answer your email and take your call and then come back in so so those who have laptops and get a constituent email or gets or have some other sort of breaking news item and they happen to be checking there was a terrorist act or something and they're on their computers are you going to be walking behind us and policing that because i i think we're we're adults here we can use common sense we certainly all have respect for our constituents uh, I, I shouldn't be punished because I utilize a phone versus a laptop. I mean, I, I, somebody could be sitting here with their laptop responding to constituent emails. They could be responding to whatever they need to respond to. Uh, and just because you have a phone here doesn't mean it's no different from a laptop. Uh, and, and again, we're in, a, we're in a society now where everything is, is now and it's immediate. But at the same time, I do think there's a, I, I think the public will know whether we're being respectful to them or not and then hold us accountable appropriately on Election Day. I, again, they, they, I assume they uh, 
<laughs> or before. Uh, but I mean, this is a, this is a, I think, I think we're all, we all assume that we're going to be respectful of not only our role here, but to, to our constituents. Uh, but there are things that come up during the day, and especially in these marathon meetings that I, I think it's unfair to not be able, again, I'm not initiating any of this stuff. I'm not sitting here reaching out to all my folks, and it, it, this is stuff that comes to us uh, that, that occasionally some of it could be disregarded. Some of it just requires a yes or a no, uh, but it, I think it puts people in a very difficult situation, unless you're retired, and that's, God bless you if you're retired, but at the same time, if you're still working, uh, I, I don't. I don't think folks ought to be punished for that uh, and, and and disadvantaged. I guess. But you are aware that this is something that we put in at the last council. Well, I wasn't aware until you pointed it out, and I appreciate you bringing it to my attention. So I, I appreciate you highlighting that. I didn't realize it was that stringent. Uh, I, I did not. I had not seen the corrected version. I saw the old version. I remember us talking about it. Uh, but, I just think it's a little aggressive. Uh, and again, if if somebody's uh, if there's a breaking story on the news and it comes up on your laptop, you get a flash and you're, you're reading about some attack or some kind of a, maybe a water main breaks under the bridge on, uh, uh, near Estero Boulevard and you want to, you, you glance at it, are you somehow now in violation? Uh, if you're helping a constituent who's got a time sensitive situation and you're in a, stuck in a six hour meeting and there's no break at the time, they ask a quick question. Uh, you know, I just, I think I get, like John said, we're, we have the ability to multitask and again, the, the important thing is, to, is, is the majority of our time, the vast majority of our time will be here, present, respectful, but there are situations that come up particularly, again, if these were, if these were one hour meetings, that'd be one thing, but this is, you know, these are all day, which is fine, but it just, you know, people have to conduct their lives to some extent, uh, but you know. But you I know, just, like again, Jim, you know, you can always excuse yourself and go and do something if an emergency happens. I think like with, with my, my laptop is not connected to the internet and my phones are on, um, on do not disturb for the meeting and um you know things can come up but typically they can wait until i you know there's a break in an hour or something the other thing is and again i'll, I'll go back to nancy on this is that you're also exposing yourself particularly if, if your personal phone to a public records request to say what you're talking about um if, if i i don't know when that threshold is if it's a quasi judicial hearing and you're messaging away to somebody um is, yeah. is that expose somebody to a public records request of their personal well, I, I have my work phone right here too. I have both. I, I separate the two. So, but again, if somebody's emailing me on my work phone or on my, my, my council phone, you know, I, I will I will wait until a break to look at that. Uh, but it's 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 the phenomenon of texting and the immediacy of society today. Uh, I think that just again, I, I, I nobody's it'd be different if people were sitting here abusing this nobody's abusing this i just don't want to get in a situation where again i'll say jim i've heard complaints from constituents about some council members being on their phone during um hearings well, really? i guess let's, okay. let's do it this way in, in, right. in the spirit of when we could go back and forth all day in in the spirit of exactly what we're talking about policies and procedures let's ask the council members would you like to see this item number four be revised and if there's a majority that's the process yep. councillor king I'm sorry, I was on my phone and my laptop. So. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Would you like to have the attorney take another stab at, at this? Uh, yes, at please. Vice Mayor Adderholt? Yes, please. I would as well. Councilor King? Or Woodson? Um, yes, and I'm, I'm sure that you've dealt with other municipalities and everything else that they have best practices that we can go with. So, yes, I would like to see it reviewed. Yeah, I would too. But I've also heard there's there's councils where they make everyone leave their phone and not take it into. The deal. Well, you know, I guess we all have lives outside of council, as Vice Mayor Adderholt said. You you know you have a personal phone. You know you have a work phone. Um, I would have a very tough time telling me somebody I couldn't ha I couldn't have my personal phone here. God forbid something happened to my wife or my child, and I wasn't able to find out about it until three or four hours later. I would not be a happy man. We're on a so, break. Uh, or wait until break to go and check it. I mean, I, I think you have to use some common sense. You have to be respectful of your position. You have to be respectful of the people that are sitting out in front of us. And I think we all do that. So I, 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 would, I, don't, I don't know that banning phones or, or cutting off communication, I mean, where do you stop? You, you can't have microphones because somebody could be listening upstairs. You can't have laptops because someone could send you an email. That's important. I mean, I just think you have to use common sense. You have to be respectful of your position, and I think everyone does that. I don't think it has to be memorialized in you can't have this, you can't have that. 
uh, we all we all go through the ethics training. We all know what we can and can't do. We all respect the process. Um, I just think that this is this is a big. It's going on. This back and forth has gone on. I think long enough to the point where we, we understand the point. We understand the counterpoints. Um, let's let the attorney do what she is good at and, and come back with some some verbiage and. Well, I'm sure we'll have this discussion again before it gets adopted through a motion. Yeah, and just so you know, your, your point though, I mean, with this current thing, it says, unless it pertains to an emergency situation. So you're never precluded from dealing with an emergency. Well, you have to check it in order to see if it's an emergency situation. <laughs> That's the challenge. <laughs> and I think, I do think like the, you know, the word receive is a little bit problematical because like you said, you, you can, you, you don't initiate a receipt, someone else does. Right, and this is what the attorney has been tasked to do. But also, Nancy, in, in doing the task is to, um, I'd like a, just an idea of what the ramifications for public records are, to or if it's a violation of things like in a you know, because we have we have like the discussion we're having now, which is kind of there's nothing binding, but we also have quasi judicial hearings, which have more stringent rules. So as far as a public record, um, I think the case law says that if it pertains to town business, it would be considered par uh, a public record and subject to disclosure unless there's an exception, specific exception in the, in the statute that would prevent its disclosure. Um, I don't think that it really makes a difference as to if it's a private piece of equipment or a public. If it is public business, it then morphs into a public record um, but everything we do I mean everything we do on our work phones is public record and yes it's, it's 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 retained but we things we do on our personal phones are not and if someone were to say I saw you on your personal phone during your quasi judicial hearing and they want to know what I was messaging then my understanding that I'd have to give all my messages over to Amy and Amy is the keeper of the public records would then determine which ones were relevant to the, the hearing which ones were not it's not true um, that is typically, but however, um, oftentimes the way I've seen it done in other cities is um, basically a request from the city clerk, who is your custodian of records, do you have any public records? And then it is your obligation to disclose if you have public records aside from your um, town-issued uh, equipment. All right. I think you have way more direction than you were anticipating. Anything else, Bill? Um, no, I think that's pretty much it. Anything else, Councilor King or Vice Mayor at all? In the interest of time, if there are some things that I would like to address with you, is it okay to email you? regarding that or should I bring it up now Are you I think if you brought it up now it would be preferable okay um, well these aren't things that you've uh, uh, changed yes okay so still continue yes all right um, one of the things that uh, I have a concern about is council selection of advisory board agency and committee members it talks about residency um, and then it mentions town ordinances, town charter, thing, uh, Florida statute, but it says uh, we will not, re uh, residency will not be a requirement for nomination or election to a committee. Yet in the code, in two places, it says if you're not a voter or a property owner, you will be removed. The town council <coughs> shall terminate the appointment of any such member. So I think that's, a, you know, that's obviously uh, a conflict or a okay. confusion. Because right now we do have several people that are not residents or voters of Fort Myers Beach serving on committees. You know, what's the pro isn't there's a process in place that they have to fill out a form or isn't there something that you have to go through if you're not a re resident of the island? Because there's been cir circumstances where, <clears throat> excuse me, there's been three positions open and three people have applied, but one of them is not a resident. And I thought there's a form you have to fill out or... And, and I, Mayor, I understand that. Yeah. It's just the code is saying they right. should be terminated. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, typically the thing has been is, is if we had like 
like Dan pointed out, if you have a, more applicants or you have more seats and you have an ap applicants, then in, we've before we've kind of been liberal with it. But if you have more applicants than you have seats, then we're more strict with it. So I'll look into that also. Thank you. What else you got, Council King? I think that's it for right now. That's it. Vice Mayor Idaho? And nothing additional. Thank you. I have nothing on this matter. Do you have anything else, Nancy? Um, just uh, bringing this back to you, um, I've got a number of uh, questions that had come up. I know that you did give specific direction on um, the issue of um, use of, communication, of electronic devices during the meeting. The other items that have come up, um, I'm thinking maybe bring them to you in a list and then you say yes, no at a subsequent meeting. Is that how you would like to do it or do you want me to just in, uh, put those changes into the draft that we have? I would say just put them into the draft and make it, is that easier for you? I mean, we... It would be easier and then uh, when it's presented, I can just highlight it. Okay. Come up with another color. With a what? With another color. You got the yeah, blue, okay. the red, the strike through. The... Yeah. You, you were gone, Councilor Woodson. Is there anything else you'd like to add to this agenda item before we move on? No. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have parking. Who wants to start with the parking? Where'd she go? Uh, do you want to take a break? Maybe she's using her phone. Let's. Uh, can we proceed out of order and come back? Yes. Move on to the next item, and then we'll come back. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna uh, move on from C and go to D. Bayside Park. Uh, Perkett Town Council's request a discussion about renaming Bayside Park. Uh, Councilor King, I believe this was your initiative. Correct. I, I just thought. And Vice Mayor Holt, I guess I should say, both of you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I need to go to my phone to get check my notes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think it's an easy fix for us um, because I know it's been a lengthy process to honor our veterans. Um, just simple uh, renaming of uh, Bayside Park. Uh, however, it wants to be done. I mean, I made a suggestion. Um, I, I'm open to however it gets done uh, or however we proceed as long as it does get done. Hey, uh, if I could just set the table a little bit and then let folks proceed from there, I, uh, I'll use my, I don't have a laptop, so I'll use my phone to read this if, that, if that's okay as I do my Google search. Uh, Memorial Day. Uh, this is a holiday that honors military personnel who died in service of our country. Veterans Day, this holiday honors everyone who has served in the military, whether or not they served in wartime or died in battle. That's the distinction between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Memorial Day, if for folks who just for historical purposes, was known to, uh, up until 1971 as Decoration Day because it was a day to go out to the grave sites and, and honor those who had, had who had killed in the line of di in the line of duty. Um, Veterans Day began as Armistice Day uh, up until 1954. It was called Armistice Day. It was based upon the hostilities formal landing in World War One, uh, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, and again it was known as Armistice Day till 54. I like the uh, I love John's concept of naming the park in honor of of of, of our veterans. I think Veterans Day is, uh, or the term veteran is more encompassing as it relates to Veterans Day, because it honors both those who are living and those who have passed in the service of our country. So I like this, and I like the concept of putting Bayside first, only because it gives people an immediate directional indication as to what the, which park we're talking about. So the concept of Bayside Veterans Park uh, is appealing to me, but this is not, uh, you know, I want everyone to be comfortable and in consensus, so I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open to any change, but that's the foundation for, for how I would view it as, again, Bayside uh, Veterans uh, Park. And I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, I just, in my mind, and I've heard a lot of other people do it, uh, the confusion between Bay Oaks and Bayside. Uh, that happens awful, awful long time, an awful lot. I think that's true, John, but what, what, what are you suggesting then as a result of that? If we put veterans first, then, and I'm not suggesting removing Bayside, because I think the location part of it is, is important as well, 
but then that's one less stumbling block of I'm I meant Bay Oaks when I said Bayside or I meant Bayside when I said Bay Oaks. I have to say I, I hadn't thought about it that way and that makes a lot of sense. So I, I'm comfortable with that. And you know, uh, I had people suggest to me that uh, you know put it to a vote. It could be something as uh, easy as uh, Beach Talk Radio takes a poll, and 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 I, I, I'm I'm comfortable with that. It's just I have a need uh, because you all have worked so hard to do this to get this done. Well, you know, that, I, I like the idea. I mean, the Westino Way came from a public poll. Um, it was I think it was commissioned by the town, not by. Beach Talk Radio, um, but I, I kind of, either way it goes, I'm, I, I like the idea of getting public input. So the waste in a way, I'll go very, it's still spelled wrong, but that's a whole different issue. Um, so a couple of things. Um, Veterans Day just passed us. It's November 11th. I would hate to wait that long. Um, but I also think that just randomly changing the name without some kind of dedication. So to make it do it, right. do it alongside where we're actually having the plaque and the renaming and that type of thing. And maybe in 2024, you know, it's an annual event at, for Memorial or for Veterans Day weekend that we have a dedication there. But I think we need to look at changing the name as soon as we're available, as we're able to with that plaque. Um, personally, I like Veterans Memorial, and I say Veterans Memorial Bayside Park, and it will end up turning into Veterans Park. If you put the Veterans first, it'll end up to be Veterans Park. It won't be Veterans Memorial Bayside Park. People won't say all that. They'll say Veterans Park versus Bayside Park. I, I like the way that rolled off. You're putting veterans first. Yeah. I'm comfortable with that as well. I'd be, I, I think to, to Councilor Veach's point, I think I, what John suggested, what I suggested, what Karen suggested thus far, uh, putting, a, putting that up to, to, for some kind of public input, I, I, th I think all of them are honoring and, uh, and, and I think appropriate. And so I, I'm comfortable with any of those options. Yeah, I mean, seeing the, the increased usage of, of Bayside Park now, I think allowing the public to have some input similar to Waste and Away, and, and just, just for <laughs> reference, Waste and Away, the reason it was, there's a lot of discussion about that. The reason it was spelt that way is the person that put in, they said usually they're waist deep in the water, and it kind of goes with that Jimmy Buffett thing. That's why they spelt it that way. I, mean, I remember we had this very long discussion about <laughs> it spelled wrong. That's not the wrong. way the lyrics are. <laughs> right, but that was kind it, of the... It's it, supposed to be kind of a pun. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> by the way, that was, I never like thought a street sign would get so much talk. <laughs> that, that was an anonymous uh, suggestion, if it, I remember correctly. It, yeah, yeah the, the person actually ran into me and said, this is, this is what I thought. Right. And I remember we had a lot of discussion, but I think... That was a fun exercise. I thought it was it was great to see some of the creativity that mm -hmm. some people have with coming up with names and and I think you know all of I think the five of us are very smart and very intuitive. It's nice to hear other suggestions outside the box. Some are very ridiculous and funny, and some are are, are very serious. And I think having that discussion was a was a fun exercise at, for the council at the time to be able to go back and forth and why they liked it, why they didn't like it. And eventually you came down to something that we're still talking about today, uh, which is a spelling. So I would be in support of, of, of if, if in fact that is the, you know, the veterans, I, I do like that word first. Um, the memorial thing, I, I don't, it's, I think to Vice Mayor Adderholt's point, um, a memorial seems to me to be that you're remembering those that were lost, not those that are continuing to serve. So, it, and I, you know, I, would, I didn't serve, so I, I it, to me, it's important to hear from those that have served or are serving to, you mean, this is for them. So I would like to hear from them and, and, and get their input on, on their thoughts of, of the naming of the park. Um, if everyone's okay with that, I don't know how the town, the town could figure out a way to get it out there to, uh, uh, let's hope we don't have to put it in the envelopes with the water bill, but I think there's a way that we could get out there and get some suggestions back um, if everyone is okay with that. Yeah. Yes. And I do, you know, I think the idea of, of using the veterans, it means, you know, then it really opens the door for a, a memorial, you know, veteran service on Veterans Day. And I know that early on this, even before I was on council, when I was working with Butch Gritcher on this, that there was one model where they actually had 
um, series of, um, of planks that had holes in them. And, and on the 11th hour of the 11th mm -hmm. day of the 11th month, the sun hit that. So they all lined up and, and illuminated something. Very nice. um, so it created an event that you could do around a memorial. But I think regardless of what, what the memorial is, I think that uh, opening yourself up for a, you know, a Veterans Day tribute would be a good thing with that. Mayor, if I, if I may, uh, I've, I've used, utilized several things like Survey Monkey, and you send mm -hmm. things out, and, and here it goes. But you need to say, <coughs> what's your choice? Not give me your opinion. Yes. Yes. So you've right. got to come right. up with three or four names and say, I okay, it, please think, choose this one. And just for your help, just to reiterate, I think we had three selections or three options thus far: Bayside Veterans Park, Veterans Memorial Park, Memorial, Memorial Bayside, Bayside, Bayside Park. Park. That was what was yours, Karen? Veterans, Veterans Memorial. Bayside, Bayside Park. Park and John you had a little did you have was that the same? That was the same thing. Okay then I guess we only had two yeah yeah and quite frankly I'm fine with either one of them. I think John's was Veteran Memorial Bayside not Bay Oaks Park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got that? You got that? That's why you okay. have time to work you know, on it. We'll, we'll, we'll work on getting that out and hopefully we can get it out soon to get it back before your next meeting and, and to, to some to, kind of feedback. And to Councillor Woodson's point if we can get with the artists and get the get the, everything done. I'm not opposed to even particularly if if if, if both Veterans Memorial are in the uh, in the name. Uh, a goal, a stretch goal, will be to have it ready by Memorial Day, and we could we could certainly do it on Memorial Day, which would be, uh, I think, I think appropriate as well. And and also, Andy, you know, you could also with the uh, FM with the Fort Myers Beach Town Facebook page, you could do surveys on that pretty quickly too. But that allows people to add. You, the option you can allow people to add or not. I think. All right. We will go. If there's no other discussion on the park, thank you. We will go back to the park to parking. <laughs> the park to parking. I have a thought. Let's hear it. If you want, to, if you want me to kick it off, uh, this is a this is just an idea. Uh, I think we've got a bifurcated conversation here. One to talk about how we what we ask for. Uh, of businesses for parking and I think we're also thinking looking at potential parking solutions um, my, my thought would be is that we work with the county and we arrange for a parking area across from Lovers Key Park uh, and that be no cost to those who are parking because it's a bit of a hardship so they park at Lovers Key Park and then we we extend the tram from ba instead of Bowditch to the library, we extend the tram all the way from Bowditch to Lover's Key, maybe add a tram, and that way we have, uh, the whole island can utilize the free tram, but it also can pick up these folks at, at uh, across from Lover's Key uh, and then bring them to either uh, the Times Square area and or any beach access, beach access along Fort Myers Beach to kind of stretch out the island a little bit, spread out some of the, the visitors so they're not all bunched up in one spot. So and it would also, by having that tram go island wide, uh, once the water ferry gets going, it could allow people to access the water ferry without getting in their car and drive into a marina. They could just hop on the tram, go to their, their closest uh, uh, public marina, hop on the water ferry. And, it, and again, it just in, increases this concept of a mass transit system that's very user friendly. And again, it utilizes the south end of the island and the south bridge, so the whole artery is not just the north bridge, just kind of spread things out. Just again, food for thought. And I'll say, you know, I've heard the, some of the chatter about people wanting to know why the trolley is stopping where it is. But the other thing I've noticed with the trolley is that... It's the tram, by the way. The tram, yeah. But yep. the tram is that they, um, and, and excuse me, because I'm speaking about the tram, is that they tend to drop people off wherever they want, not necessarily at the stops. And I found that could be a huge traffic slower. Because when they do stop and they're not at a stop, then legally no one can pass them. That middle lane is not meant for passing. And people have got that to could be corrected by driver training, though, obviously. If we could, it we almost could seems to be a policy. Well, and I'm, I'm also thinking that the tram signs aren't necessarily there anymore. I mean, we used to have tram stops, but those signs are gone. I mean, there's one pavilion outside of Publix, but... I mean, all of that has to be reestablished because they're not there. Yeah. So that's why I think you see so many stops because people, you know, unless they're at Times Square or they're in front of Publix, there's no designated tram stops anymore. Well, there's the bus stops. 
where the road goes around it, and they're pretty. But you yeah, think about you two. think about those fairs and trade shows that they have out there at Lover's Key. There's a lot of cars parked there. If, if this would obviously just be during season, but again, to try to stretch out instead of having the one artery on the north end, utilize that south end. We did it a lot for the the, the uh, when the Sandcastle competition was. Some people would park at Lover's Key, then mm -hmm. come over, and it just seems like it's a way to spread out the uh, the traffic piece and also uh, utilize that Lover's Key area but also utilize the tram for everyone on the island, but also potentially uh, beef up the water ferry when it comes, when it's up and running. So anyways, it's not going to solve all the problems, but it just, when you can use that tram to go up and down the island, it might create some economic development opportunities, create, again, a, 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 a dynamic where that the, people would say, why would they park at Lover's Key when they, they're going to want to be closer? Well, if it's free parking, that might encourage folks who are on a budget mm -hmm. to just to go ahead and go through the hassle of, taking the tram all the way down or wherever wherever they want to stop on the island, any beach access they could stop at and do their beach stuff. And so, again, just this is just, we're, I assume we're just spitballing today. So yeah, I, just, I guess for the, <clears throat> for the sake of time, I thought this was going to be a discussion about parking for businesses or parking garages or I, well, I know how that plays into it, but. I, there is a, there is that discussion that really needs to come. I think I think for the tram. No, not not just no, not the tram. It's actually our rules and um, calculations of parking spots and that type of thing. I think are in direct opposition of what we're trying to achieve by a walkable downtown community and you know utilizing pedestrian traffic and bicycle traffic and all that and i think they just fight with each other well, well i think they're concurrent i guess to me would be a better way to put it because yes you want to promote walkability and bikeability but the reality is not everybody can walk and not everybody can bike and people are going to bring cars so you have to address it you can't just say in my opinion you can't just say we're not going to have any parking in the downtown zoning district because we want you to ride bike or walk it's just not a feasible thing to be able to do so how do we address that? And, and I think we have to, as I was saying in the meeting on Monday, you, you have to look at it at a global, mm -hmm. you know, not just a business by business. You have to right. look at it globally. How do we, how do we attack this monster that we're going to have a big problem with as we continue to develop and build out where we're going to put these cars? How are we going to get things done? It's going to take a lot of talk. It's going to take a lot of work with, you know, between the, the municipality and, and private partnerships. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it, the first step is, is going through our land development code figuring out what restrictions we can remove to entice right. people to at least come to the table yep. and want to talk about doing something. Um, and then we can look at how do we make it so that if we have some land that we're using for parking that we can contribute to something that could be beneficial for everyone to allow people to get out of their cars and start walking. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's, that's kind of where I would like to start, if, if everybody's okay with it, with Sarah's, you know, looking through some of these things. Is there a way that you and your staff can go through modernize some of these things the intent was there i think when when some of these codes were written for for the right purpose obviously now we're in, in, a, in a whole different atmosphere where we have to look at things a little bit differently and a little more realistically we've all seen parking garages that you can't even tell they're a parking garage from the street even though they're right up mm -hmm. to the street they just look like part of the building so i i, I would just encourage you to look at that um, you also had mentioned in the meeting sarah on monday that there was a book or there was a rule that you have to, you actually, that's how you calculate. Because I had asked the question about how do we calculate these parking spaces and the requirements. Um, but I think you have to use some common sense. If it was working before without those parking spaces, why can't it work again uh, in the same scenario? And I think in staying, trying to stay consistent in, in, with what this council has made decisions over the last 14, 13, 14 months is allowing people to have back what they had before that they didn't have the option to do both commercially as well as residentially to stay you know to stay con you know consistent so that you're not giving one person more of an advantage of another you're, you're just simply allowing people the, the the possibility of getting more if you want more but you can get back by right what you had what before you had. to right. entice you to stay if you were a small landowner or if you were a larger landowner i think to me that that's important is to stay consistent, mm -hmm. um, but it starts with looking at this code and seeing how we can fix some of these things and alleviate. And you've been around a long time, you know, and you understand other municipalities and what they've done to, you know, these planners that come in are nice, but they don't know our area and they don't know this 
like you would know it. I mean, you've been here long enough to understand the challenges that we face. You've heard all of us talk enough. You've heard previous councils talk enough. Um, so I would rely heavily on staff uh, with this particular discussion item to, to give us suggestions. And this is what we could do that we think would really help alleviate some of the issues that we're dealing with so that we don't have people having to come in and spend you know, money that they don't need to spend on something that I think we're all trying to achieve. Um, I know it's very long-winded, but I'll stop. And th th those are my two cents for the parking part of this. Yeah, and I, I do really like the whole concept of building back. It's a disaster recovery. Mm -hmm. So if you had 17 spots before, you can build back with 17 spots. If you had zero spots before, you can build back with zero spots. Um, and and just that, however like, that can be if, worded. Or, but it was like the post-disaster build back of the one we just had. It, it wasn't building back the same square footage. It was building up that's bigger square footage, which had more requirements for it. I do think the one one thing that I think is you know one of the realities is because certainly the one of the one of the gems we have is you know the Times Square Old San Carlos area where there are little small lots, small businesses that maybe if if the business is if the if the lot is less than a certain number of square feet then and they're in the you know pedestrian zoning district maybe they don't have the parking requirements because a lot of those it if, if the only place I could put parking would be in front of their shop which would take away street parking and um, eliminate some of the curb appeal because now people are behind a car so I think that maybe some kind of car some kind of exception for smaller lots in the downtown area where maybe they don't need a requirement um, but I and I understand you know what you said about getting back where things were but the other part of that is we knew there were we had some systemic problems here with traffic and with parking people complained a lot about not enough parking people were saying that people driving around looking for parking was contributing to traffic so I think that you know the bar ought to be come up with a way to to improve the situation for parking um, and and not necessarily you know don't don't allow parking that was there to go away necessarily but I think the the real odd, ideal parking solution will be something that is can hold a lot of cars and it's very accessible from the north I appreciate what Jim said but it seems that like most of our traffic problems come from the north you know south when you're leaving but then they're going north and so I think the north is a focus to where we really need to have some kind of parking I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit if you read through I mean there's a lot of it and it jumps kind of all over in here when you talk about parking but there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for, for example signage most other places that you go to have the universal blue sign right now we don't really allow that you know blue sign that says this many spots available I think that helps people if it says lot full they're going to continue on things like that I think that are very easy policy changes and code changes that we can make to help entice people to not drive around and just continue to look I can tell and that's something that down the road if there is an app of some sort that can tie into the town and says this lot is full it's all real-time information that can go back and forth um, but a little small sign you know they all look the same we've all see the, the blue signs with the white P on them mm -hmm. things like that you know the buffers for the parking garage that just doesn't make sense to me why you have to have two stories a 20 feet buffer to be able to have a parking garage no one's going to build that um, it, it's those kind of things allowing people to have now I understand your point Bill and I agree with you if you had a thousand square feet and you had 17 spaces and now you're building 3,000 square feet and you want 17 spaces that to me goes back to the to whoever is doing it I mean if you think you can make three times the space work with the same amount of parking that's a business decision that's mm -hmm. not a policy decision um, you have to still but I think as a town we have to look again I keep saying it globally what is the solution we really have to work hard with some partners to come up with a solution globally that works to get people to get off of the Cerro Boulevard um, one it's a safety issue and, and two it's a traffic issue and, and I think it can be done I think it's going to take a lot of hard work it's going to take a lot of negotiation but I, I think we're all up for the challenge uh, hopefully Andy and, and Frankie are as well um, to get out there and be proactive and, and start contacting these people but I think it starts with us and making these policy these these easy policy decisions that we can make so that when we do sit down at the table with these people they understand that we're serious they understand that uh, you know we, we want to work with them with parking like we just did with the whale um, you know but also it hopefully opens up the door to allow us to have communications with them and that was one of the reasons why I asked what the interior height was of the whale of the three variances that they were asking for these decisions that we're talking about that could have eliminated one is there a way through the height on the inside where you could have shaved a foot and a half off of each floor height in their case they couldn't do it 
But is there a way that, you know, if you come in with a 15-foot floor height and you're asking for a 6-foot variance for height, well, can you really take a foot or a foot and a half off each floor to not have to have that variance but still do what you want to do? So I think it just opens doors for the applicants as well as the council to, to maybe not have to deal with so much paperwork for the staff to get to us to make decisions. Because one thing that really kind of gets under my skin is we have a staff that, that looks at the code and they make and lately it's just been everything has been approved so what's the point of having a staff review something if you're just going to approve everything so how do we eliminate that to help staff be able to get to a yes not a no and, and you know or an approval versus denial so that it, it's it's not fighting each other internally staff and, and council and I know I'm being very long-winded again but I think I've made my point yeah, well, I, I, can, I understand the, the kind of, you know, the criteria the staff uses. They, they look very strictly at the code to give us a recommendation. That's your job, yeah. But then it's our decision from then to go. And I'm, I'm comfortable with that because I just, I, I prefer that they do what they're supposed to do in, in that strict letter because that's kind of the role. Sure, sure. My point is just I, I, they, take, they take a lot of time to review the codes that we have in place. And it seems like often, more often than not, rightfully so, their recommendations are for denial because of the way the codes are written. So let's fix the code so that that can go from a denial. And, and now we're all on the same page. So and I think some of these things in the parking, if you go through it, and I, I don't want to speak for you, Sarah, but I think I see you nodding over there. I think you agree that there's a lot of things that we can update in this parking codes that that will help alleviate a lot of the variances and a lot of staff time and a lot of cost to the applicant. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing, I mean, if there's like a vegetative buffer, I know I've seen some places where they had vertical gardens which is kind of like a vegetated buffer, but doesn't take yeah. the space. Yeah, I mean, it, it just so looks, you can't even tell it's a parking garage. It just looks like a nice flower wall. I mean, there's, right. they have them all over in Naples. You go down there, they're part, you drive by a parking garage, you think it's someone's house. You don't even know right. what you're looking at. So. Yep. Or, you know, or, or potentially do some business as a front on the ground level for the curb people to get some extra use. I think those are maybe good things we could, we could encourage in the code. Another, another kind of thing we have at our disposal now is we have, you know, most of the old town hall property. And we could put a surface parking in there. And, you know, that could be something done fairly quickly um, to alleviate problems, I mean, maybe even for this season. Um, unfortunately, it's not a great thing for traffic because people have to drive all the way down to town hall to get it. But there's a trolley right there or to ride back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> trolley parking, no less. You can just go sit in one that's not moving. Councilor King, you have some input you'd like to share? I'm in a huge uh, agreement with you, Mayor, but um, again, and I brought it up Monday because I was approached by a, a county commissioner about what they wanted, a possibility for Lynn Hall Park. Uh, being, he, you know, he suggested two-tiered. Um, does it have to stop there? Um, do we really have the ability to influence the county? Should we? Um, I think we should and we could. And I think, you know, that's maybe an easy solution as well. Yeah, I think when, once the uh, Times Square group, I call them the group now because they're all kind of working together, when they come forward with what, it, you know, what they've kind of, that'll give us that opportunity to be able to sit down with the county and say, here's what they think. We're all kind of on the same page. How can we incorporate that into your Crescent and Lynn Hall Park, um, you know, with the two bathrooms versus having to have bathrooms for every single, per, every single business, things like that. So... I think once they're done with that, which I've been told is going to be probably late December, mid-January, they should have Great. something. I think when we can see that, then we mm -hmm. can really have that sit down with the county right. and, and kind of get them, because they're, they're kind of, we'll do whatever the town wants us to do is kind of the mentality that we've taken so far, and, and, uh, and which is great. fine. I'm certainly willing to, to call, that, call that out. Um, here, you know, here's our plan. Here's what we think we will work. Here's what everybody's buying into. Now, how can we incorporate your part into it? And I think they'll be very open to, to, I agree. to, to what we want to do. And I'll just say, I think I've expressed before, I'm not a big fan of using Lynn Hall Park, <laughs> because I think it will, uh, there, there's, there's um, view corridors there that, that will be lost. Um, it's not particularly attractive, and you know, it's a beachfront. That's very kind of premium property to put a structure like that, in my opinion. Well, I think it's important that, I mean, we have to accept the reality. Whether there's no changes or not, the view corridors are going to drastically change in Times Square just because they can by right. So I think we have to, people I think have wrapped their head around, you're not going to see the single level buildings that were there anymore. You're going to see something that's starting at 18, 19 feet 
and it's going to go 30 feet at mo you know, right now, is it 30 feet, I think? You can go down there 30 or 35, something like that? Uh, yeah, it's between 30 and 40, depending on the specific location. So, so you're looking at buildings that are 55 feet in the air to the peaks, potentially, where they were maybe 16 foot before? And, uh, and do we have the right to tell the county what to do on their property? I mean, um, <laughs> well, yeah, we do. I would, I'm sorry? <laughs> They're within us jurisdiction. They have to get a permit from us. But I would like to see us work together as, as what could possibly happen. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just, agree just saying that we're talking about we're already going to lose view corridor. So we have Crescent Beach Park now. We have um, Lynn Hall Park as view corridors downtown. And um, I think it would be a, a big loss to, to Lynn Hall Park view corridor. I guess I'm really trying to f struggle with what the view corridor is there because yeah, when I ours. remember seeing the pier presentation, it was what, the 7-Eleven was across the street? And they, they specifically, Alan specifically talked about uh, there was nothing that would be blocked, you know, the views wouldn't be blocked there. And I, I, I'm thinking about on the street level, people are walking, people are driving, and the views will be blocked because this is, is going to be bigger than what's there. So the view corridor, as you still see the open, you can still see the openness, you can see the trees. Um, there is a view corridor there and, and even more so on uh, Crescent Beach. Well, I think the discussion with that park is going to be a very interesting one where everybody's going to have a very different, well, some will have different opinions than others, obviously, but we've got to get to that point first. We got we got to we got to get to the the point where we can see what they want in Times Square and and see how that works and how does it tie into that how does it tie into potentially Crescent Park or potentially tie into Margaritaville I mean there's a lot of different scenarios and I I, I do I do like what you said Dan though the idea of trying to optimum would be that we come up with a common sense parking garage code that would encourage private industry to do it so it's really not something that we had to give up our park or give up space to do mm -hmm. that you know private industry does it or maybe we do like a private public partnership with we own where we own part of that to bring it to the table i think those have a lot of possibilities but i think you know coming up with a little smarter regulation for the parking garage is something that i think is a good idea what else you got councilor king uh, that's it thanks mayor uh, nothing additional at this time good discussion are we okay then, uh, Councilor Woodson? You got anything else? No, I'm good. Are, Thank you. Are we okay with the, the suggestion of, of leaning on staff to come back with recommendations to wording, um, not just on parking garages but parking in general? To go ahead, you got a question. Would, I was going to say, how does staff, like, staff feel like, about So that? I've I've been thinking about this concept um, regarding you know what might work and what options exist. Um, we can certainly look at what it says in the code regarding. Um, the requirements for specific businesses and update those see what the new numbers look like for, through the ITE and we can look at decreasing those some towns have a maximum parking requirement and that is you can't provide more than X number of spaces per this many feet or you know however it's broken down um, but I think that you were on the right track when you first started talking about you know you really have to approach it from both sides. You have to approach it from the transportation aspect, you know, providing other means, pedestrian, bicycle, tram. Um, you have to have other options because you still want people to get to those businesses. They still have to come there somehow. Um, <coughs> right now, our, our bike system, while we should theoretically be very bikeable, we may not be as bikeable as we would like to think we are right. because we don't have bike lanes. So people are utilizing sidewalks and pedestrians are utilizing sidewalks. This creates a conflict. There are issues with that. Um, so we need to look at, at approaching this from all sides, not just not providing parking spaces, but putting parking spaces in some places. Maybe we need to look at public private partnerships, determine where it makes sense to have, you know, I know, you know, we were talking about Lynn Hall Park. We were talking about next to Yucatan. We were talking about um, over at the old uh, town hall lot. If we look into options for public-private partnerships where, you know, we would put out an RFP and someone else would manage that, it would be paid for um, by the money that it generates, but that money would be fronted potentially by a developer and they would handle that. Um, but we that way we would have the option 
of, you know, once we put out the RFP, what works the best for the town? What's the best plan and, you know, design and how is it most beneficial to the community and provide those parking spaces? Mm -hmm. um, you can also have something like a parking benefit district where um, money generated from parking goes back into the community and pays for things like sidewalks and benches and street trees. And that makes it a more walkable community even more. Um, so there are lots of ways that you can approach this topic. Uh, I, I was looking at what other communities do. You know, there's resident parking passes where residents who live here can get a parking pass. And then, you know, if, if you want to drive down to your favorite restaurant, you don't live in the downtown. You're not anywhere near the downtown. You might think, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find parking and I don't feel like walking five blocks, my feet hurt. I, or, you know, if you have a disability, you're unable to get there. Um, you know, having some options for people to potentially buy into a parking pass system and give residents some additional options. Um, there's also, you know, we, you were talking about signage. Um, previously, we'd looked at some apps the town had I think that was before Ian looking at apps that tell us where there are parking spots. We did a um, an evaluation of parking previously and determined that it looked like there was actually more than enough parking. But the problem is people don't know where it is. You know, if you're a visitor, you're coming here, you don't know where to find the parking and you're going to where your location is, where you're trying to get to and then driving <laughs> around in that area looking for parking. You don't maybe know that three blocks over there's a parking lot that's completely full or completely empty. So um, having some options for people who maybe aren't in the area and, you know, everybody who logs onto their little app, they can see where there is parking available. That could also be paid for um, by parking costs. Um, and I, I want to point out that SB 250 if we remove parking requirements, so if we were to go to something like a parking maximum and we were to de decrease or even eliminate parking requirements, that could put us in a position where two years down the road, we're like, oh, this isn't working. We don't have enough parking spots. You know, residents are finding it really problematic. Businesses are, you know, struggling a little bit. We may not be able to put those requirements back in place. So I, I think we need to approach this from all sides and we need to look at how other communities are doing this. And I think that we can come up with a good solution that can get us part of the way there. I did want to point out that we are trying to allow people to come back with the number of parking spaces that they had. The difference with the one that you saw on Monday was that they were almost doubling their square footage. Um, so I know that the owner f feels that they're going to be just fine without those parking spaces, but it really wasn't something that staff felt that they could reasonably say, well, it's the same thing. Um, so we really felt that that needed to be part of the variance request in that instance. No, I understand. And I think you guys have done a really good job on several instances of, of finding a path to not making it more restrictive and you're not taking away anything. You're actually giving them a benefit to be able to get some things back based on what they had before. And I, I just think keeping that same mindset going forward with this parking mm -hmm. seems to me is it makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously, if they could provide more, I'm, I'm sure they would. Uh, but a lot of properties can't. Um, so I, I guess that's my mentality looking at it is, is try to look at how they had what they had before. And I understand the square footage part of it. But again, you could talk about how that ties into now ADA compliances and elevators that are needed and all the things that they didn't need before that they need now, which inherently is, increases that square footage. So how much of that increased square footage is actual usable space when it comes to visitors or guests coming in. So um, that's just kind of the, and, and I think you guys have done a great job of looking at it listening to us and then once it goes through the LPA process and gets to us it really worked it, so far it has seemed to work itself out where the majority of the people that I've talked to if not all of them have been at least happy that they're getting back what they had before and there it is, is allowing them a path to come back that they wouldn't have been able to do before and I think this falls into that same category for me at least anything else so I didn't see you say yes or no are you up for the challenge <laughs> so so the first the first step is going to be I'm going to look at the ITE regulations and try to figure out how many parking spaces are now, you know, how close we are to being in line with that. I'm going to try to come back to you guys and show you kind of where we're at with that. 
And if that isn't going to be much of a difference, then we can look at other approaches, maybe decreasing that, what that might look like if we should create parking districts where, you know, we say within this district, it's this percentage, the parking within this, because we currently do that with the downtown. Some places are required to have 50%, some none of it, some of it 67%. So, you know, looking at what makes sense, because, I mean, there are certainly places on the island that really are not walkable or bikeable, you know, they're a little bit further out of the way. And we wouldn't want to say they don't need to provide parking because people won't be able to get there. I think most businesses are going to recognize that and provide the appropriate amount. But, you know, I, I think that this is a, um, the best place to start is just seeing where we are in regard to current regulations, generally best practices. Okay. Anything else for parking? If not, we'll move on. The 2020, next is item E, 2024 Town Council Schedule. Uh, per Council's request, a discussion about the additional 2024 Council meetings. Council Woodson, I believe this is... <laughs> but it's I think I brought this up. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm just concerned we're at the tip of the iceberg now with what's going to be coming in as far as new building, new developments, rebuilding, that type of thing. And I know we continually see an uptick on permits that are being requested and this kind of thing. And I just, I'm just fearful that with like the LPA, for example, they only meet once a month. These things drag on because we can't get it on an agenda item earlier than later. Um, and if it was possible to have two LPA meetings a month, I think it would keep the meetings from being quite as long as they are. Um, but we could also get more things through the funnel. And the same with town council. Maybe we don't have a meeting every week, but maybe we have three meetings a month that we can balance our agendas more efficiently, that staff still has time to get through things um, but I think that funnel might be, it might even it out a little bit more if we had more meetings that we could do that. M&P, the same thing. Is one time a month enough, or should it be twice a month? So I'm just opening it up to, is there a way to move through this process quicker, more quickly, not have us being the hold up because we don't have a council meeting coming up for another two weeks, or we don't have a... LPA meeting coming up for another month. Yeah, I think it was Vice Mayor Erholt that said, it, if I'm not mistaken, that when you brought this up on, her, on Monday, I believe it was, that mm -hmm. you don't, I agree with him and, and that relying heavily on the town manager and the staff on this is they see the workload that comes in long before we do. They get to see, you know, wow, we're really, we're really ramping up. I, I'm comfortable with leaving that decision. I'll meet as many times as we need to meet. That, that's not an issue for me. Uh, I just don't want to go too far where we're scheduling things that w now we're trying to find things to put on the agenda versus holding things up. I think it's easier to say, you know, next month we should have, we're going to have to have three meetings or four meetings because we've just seen five new developments that come in that are going to take up a lot of time. So I, can, I completely understand. But I think this, this should be driven by the town manager and the staff. They, they see the input before we see it. And I just hate to to waste their time scheduling meetings when there's, you know, we're we're not really talking about anything. Not that that would happen where we're at. But. <laughs> I can't imagine that that's going to happen. <laughs> but, um, but if it does, we could always cancel a meeting. But yeah. um, but I also think without the right planning in place, I mean, we all know how difficult it is to get everybody's schedules in sync. And if we don't have meetings already on our calendars. They get pushed out anyway. It just, you know, we all have busy lives. So I would rather cancel a meeting as opposed to trying to add one and get five, seven, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people's schedules in alignment. That's more to than add that. a meeting. We got 12, well, more than that. I mean, so it say 20. <laughs> we got all of the staff, we've got everybody. So I guess I would rather err on the side of having more meetings on schedule and have to cancel one because we don't have enough agenda items I just can't imagine that happening and, and I see that I, I'm trying to look at it as the, the devil's advocate if you will when you see you know we're fortunate enough that we have a, a town manager now who is, is making his department heads 
available to us at meetings to be able to answer questions that maybe he doesn't know so that we can get the direct answer but every minute that they're here they're not able to do their actual job so I, I see it from that point as well so that's why I, I lean heavily on the town manager we hired him for a reason he, he understands our, our charge he understands how important it is for us to get things through the funnel as fast as possible through land development code changes or, or through it's it's just a timely issue that needs to get done he can call a meeting anytime he wants um, I, I think that I, I, I again I, and I'm, I'm okay either way however it goes if, it, if we're gonna have four meetings a month three meet whatever it is I'm okay with that too but I, I just don't I think it's let, let's try one way first and if that doesn't work then we can we can make the policy decision that we want to have four meetings or we have to adjust the charter then I would think would that be a charter amendment we'd have to do I, think so. I have to look I'm okay. sorry I don't know right offhand. Yeah. but I, I appreciate one thing you said there Dan and I you know I mean I don't know if the town council is the hold up in a lot of things but when we do have meetings it means we have staff that are not doing their work and so if we're pulling planners and these people off of their actually getting the permits and things out just for a week and meet then we're really not necessarily streamlining the process yeah. one, one thing we see going into the first quarter uh, of the calendar year uh, because January 1st is on a Monday the first meetings the next week so we're going to have a, a meeting the first three months every two weeks so that kind of we don't have that extra week in there in January that pushes us that leaves that big gap so we can kind of review it as we go and just see how keep up with the volume and see what what's in the pipeline because because we know pretty well ahead of time what we want to do and call a special meeting um, LPA probably have to make their decisions but well, we can work with that. I, well, I think where it's important to really keep an eye on it are, are those that have maybe been, for whatever reason, hung up in a permitting process. You know, they've submitted their application to do whatever it is they're going to do, and for whatever reason, revisions on their end or because of the staff's recommend, whatever it is, it's held it up three or four months. That's something to me. If you have two or three of those, that's something that constitutes a meeting. Let's not make them wait another two months or another 30 days to have to go through. That's something that I think we could get in here now that it's gone through the process so to me I'm sympathetic to the people that are trying to go through the process because as I've said many times it's very difficult for someone that's never been in this arena that has to go through permitting and has to get especially in a coastal community so once they finally get through that what is it that we can do to Karen's point to no longer hold up that process now it's ready to make a decision let's have a meeting to make the decision for them so they can get on with their lives mm -hmm. So, Mayor, I think I have the answer to your question. Okay, let's um, hear it. So, what your charter establishes are the minimum requirements for you to meet. Okay. And That's so, great. basically, you could call a special meeting and identify specifically on the agenda what items would be discussed at that special meeting, and then that can help eliminate if you have the example that you gave about, you know, a couple projects that really needed some council uh, review very mm -hmm. expeditiously. So you could call special meetings. Yeah, and I think with the LPA, I think it's important to get their input on this as well. Maybe not all of them have the time or can meet more than once a month or right. twice a month, although it seems that they're willing to move their schedules around. They've got many more people that they can get a quorum. So, uh, you know, and I think most of the members in talking to them, they, they're open to if we got to have a meeting to get this whatever project or three projects moved along, let's do it. So uh, I, I, I'm open to whatever... The, the will of the council is but I, I my thought is let's let the manager and the staff review things and, and maybe we have to give us an update here's how many things are in the pipeline you know what do you think should we have a meeting an extra meeting next month I think mm -hmm. getting that information of what's in the pipeline what's being held up how long it's been held up will, will help us make that decision so we're not wasting the staff's time or our time or oh, the, the applicants time yeah I like the pipeline um, piece of it so that you can actually visually see what's happening and what's coming to us yeah although I'm not sure some things they probably know some things just just when someone applies for it right but yeah well I think that's where we after come they in. apply yeah. we see the emails of people that have been in permitting for three yeah. months or four months oh, yeah. we can know we can we can suggest well, let us know this is one of those things that should be on that pipeline you know what I'm saying with, yeah. if, if there's an issue with permitting we all hear it yeah, what, what we're going to do, obviously, we've talked uh, a couple of you about monthly reports. We're going to be bringing those back the, for the January report. We'll, we'll start 
that'll be part of that. We'll make sure we include some of that, you know, verbiage in there, who, who's applied and where we are, and try to try to just give everybody a heads up what, what's out there. In case you start hearing things somewhere else, you can kind of communicate with us, hey, we might need to think about a special meeting and, and, and do something here. But we, we can keep that in, in front of everybody. You okay with that? I'm good with that, yep. Thank you. And you know, the, uh, I'm also okay with you know long meetings. I don't think I think the LPA has had more marathon meetings than we have. <laughs> well, their their thoughtful thinking makes ours a little bit easier. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, also probably meeting once a month as a part of that too. So I mean, if the LPA thinks two short meetings a month is better than one long one, I think mm -hmm. that's a decision they can make. Sure. Any other comments on the council schedule? I would just say to the town manager uh, and staff, if if you the other piece of this puzzle to, to to Karen's point is if you see a large or controversial item coming up that's going to take a two or three hour debate, we're going to have some projects that are probably going to do that. Maybe that's when we bifurcate that meeting so that folk, poor folks who are either before or after them have to wait for three hours and and uh, and that meeting we know is going to go long. Uh, maybe that's the time to, to infuse that in additional meeting or have a special meeting for that particular project, especially if there's going to be 50 to 100 people testifying. I've seen situations before as well where you have a certain part of the meeting in the morning, you break for lunch, and then you have something in the afternoon. We have that luxury because we're not meeting at night, and you don't have marathon meetings until 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm not saying that's where we go, but there's just opportunities <laughs> if we have we, to. We have had meetings in this town that have lasted days. Mm -hmm. All right, any other input? Hearing none, then we'll move on to agenda management. Councilor Veach. Um, I've got nothing. I think I, I'm looking at some of the things that are on the list now. Um, you know, the what is workforce housing? What are the options? I think we've kind of reviewed that. They can probably come off. Um, that's about all there that really I think I put on. Okay. Councilor Woodson. Um. And I think Andy might be bringing this up, but based on that presentation this morning, it, it, we're kind of, I think it was kind of left in limbo, like where do we go with this? Um, so maybe that's something, and maybe Andy wants to address that too. Or it, it, yeah, If I can, <clears throat> Mayor, at this time, I think we've, we've also got on here a, um, um, I don't see it right now, but the council strategic planning session. You know, that, I think that's something that we need to plan for possibly... Um, uh, end of January or February to discuss a, a, a strategic planning, prepare for budgeting, that type of thing, and then add something like this to that conversation so we focus strictly on those type of things so it's not part of a bigger meeting. I think that maybe, and to Karen's point too, because we've talked to three different groups and then, you know, maybe leave it up to staff to make a, come up with some, some uh, ways to go forward with it. And maybe even have some conversations with the county um, to get them on board early on, so they have some ownership for the process. I think we can, you know, we can engage uh, staff between now and the next MMP, and and come back to that while we're still planning a strategic um, planning session, and and just keep this in, on the forefront as we work with the county on their interest and and. and you know, we, we we met with three of them. One of them, Fiber, said, you know, it basically it's not going to be uh, any charge. I think uh, ULI is somewhere between eighty and one hundred fifty thousand dollars. What they had told me, and then we've got a, a, a figure for a phase one type thing from here. So, and they were working with Fiber, so I've got to figure out that connection and how that and, and works it, together. And maybe the the with collaboratory, maybe the grant they're talking about for Fiber could also apply to Scape. I don't know that, but. That's what we got to find. They, they all seem to be in the same circle. <coughs> all right. That's all. Vice Mayor Earl. Caught you mid drink. I have uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing additional. Councilor King? Nothing. I just have one item that I'd like to see, uh, just, just an idea that has come up over the last week. In, in, you know, we're hearing a lot of condo talk now, which we knew was going to be coming. Um, parts are starting to come in. Uh, permits are starting to get... I wonder if it would it would be beneficial to have a meeting, whether it's an MMP meeting or you know maybe a out of order uh, MMP meeting or if a specific council meeting, specifically about condos and the challenges that they're facing. An update on you know we could do it one on one, but I think being able to hear from them as a collective group to be able to come in and let us know that the challenges that they're having, 
Um, what we are seeing on our end, maybe we can invite the fire district in to be part of that conversation because they are part of it. Um, you know, a lot of times people get something's being held up. It could be held up by us. It could be held up by some sort of thing from the fire district. So I think being able to get the three groups in one room to be able to talk this through and understand the challenges that all three sides are facing, quite honestly, I think it would be very beneficial to the south end of the island and the condo owners down there because a lot of questions are starting to come in and getting those answers for one person and then another person. And every condo, as I saw Dave Nesbaum say yesterday, uh, you know, every condo is a unique situation. Mm -hmm. So let's get those unique situations in a room. Some might overlap, some might not. Maybe it's a lengthy meeting, maybe it's not. But I think that's a specific meeting that should happen, at least my opinion. Um, I'll defer but to my... I, I would, again. if I could, Mr. Mayor, I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, I love the idea of having it part of an M and P because then it's a public meeting, mm -hmm. then it's broadcast because there's a lot of condo board members who just aren't in town right. and are, aren't able to come back to town because they, they can't get back into their condo. So if it was broadcast, having all the subject matter experts there, having the fire department there, I think is critical, and then broadcasting that because not only do you solve problems, but you also these folks share best practices and things that have worked and the and the regulators and the the permitting folks could say hey here's what we see these are the these are the things where you get caught up into problems avoid this avoid that and to have that be broadcast for any condo board member or quite, quite frankly anybody who lives in a condo to hear that i think that'd be wonderful yeah I, I mean there's a lot of it'll help dispel some of the rumors i was seeing yesterday on social media uh, about short term rentals people were having were upset that you know, they have to pay $500 for every single rental that they have. Well, that, that's not the case. And, and they didn't, they were unaware that the $100 per room was no longer there. So I think something that's just one scenario, but having the conversations and however long that meeting needs to be is how long it needs to be. Because we have a lot of condo owners with a lot of questions in there. You know, rightfully so, they want to get back in their property and, and for them to understand what the true holdup is. Some of it's contractor issues. When you look up some of these permits, it's a, contractors aren't necessarily telling them the exact truth. So I think to be able to hash all of that out so that we're all on the same page and we all understand that, you know, they, I think it's important that they understand that all of our doors are open and all of our emails are open and reach out to us. And if you have a question, don't be afraid to ask it. If you think it's right or wrong, just ask it and we'll get the answer. So having this forum, I think, could be beneficial for, for the property. And maybe it needs to be real early in after the holidays right. or sooner if they want to Kick do it. it I mean, I know the holidays, year. everybody's kind of busy and maybe can't be attending, but maybe just after the holidays, something, it'll be a busy week, but maybe we could try to fit it in that first week of January so that everybody knows it's coming and, and, and can participate if they can, because that seems to be when we see the influx of people come I've back. I've asked John Dolmer and Frank to meet with me in the morning at 7.30 to specifically talk about condos. So we're going to start that, you know, behind the scenes, might engage Sarah uh, if, if she's willing. Um, and able to to uh, attend that and then we can try to schedule something toward the end of the week that first week of January that kind of you know after everybody gets back from whatever they're doing and recovers from our, our but, fantastic but, but, fireworks show but so important to have it broadcast uh, not only through the town but through Beach Talk Radio because <laughs> yes. just a lot of these folks they just can't be in town because their condos aren't Aren't, you can't live in their condos, so I, I love the idea of having the fire department here as well, and they can just explain what they're facing, best practices, what they're running into, uh, and then again the condo. So some of the condo associations have been very successful. Uh, everybody's running into different problems, but if they could share some of their best practices, things that they've done that worked, uh, vendors that they've utilized that have been spectacular. I mean, there's just there's a lot of opportunity for really really good to come out of that, Mr. Mayor. So I, I think that's a great idea. And, and I think that's already done for the most part through the Condo Association of Fort Myers Beach. They're very good about that. But that would be the avenue uh, I to reach out to, uh, uh, and I can get a contact to Andy for that. So I think it's a great idea as and well. And John, that is a great association. But a lot of the condo board members don't necessarily participate in those members True. or meetings because they're out of town. and they're But not, they do get emails. Yeah, they get emails. But I just think every condo board member, and quite frankly, the condo, people who live in mm -hmm. the condos, yes. they're in, they want to be more engaged. And if they could just tune in, maybe they'd better understand why they're getting because a lot of these folks are very frustrated. Oh, yeah. They yeah. can then be begin to better understand what the challenges are and, and that other condos are facing similar challenges. And yeah, I mean, ideally, I think it would be great if we could get, you know, the presidents of all the associations in here at least to give an update as to where they're at, you know, for our benefit as well as, as their, you know, the people that they're representing, um, and then take the questions how we have to take the questions. And if we can figure out a way and 
technology is there. It's not that difficult to, yeah. to allow people to ask questions that can't be here. Um, right, because some of them I know in, in our uh, association, uh, our guy, the president, is acting as the contract, a general contractor for that. So, I mean, he's busy. <laughs> sure. um, so, uh, yeah, just an avenue to look. You know, and then again, he could designate somebody to come in. But, uh, yeah, broadcast is the key, including all the uh, associations. All right. Is there anything else to add to the, uh, the good of the order? Seeing none, we are adjourned.